We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Antry and I'm here with... Rob H. Surprise. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, yeah, I was supposed to be away this week, but... Uh... Well, a whole bunch of things, and it's led to recording on a Tuesday night, which is unusual, but I, I'm here, and I know, I, or at least I suspect strongly, that, uh, that people are disappointed by that, because we got a gajillion questions come in this week, which must have been like, oh, good, Rob's away, I can finally get somebody else's opinion on this stuff, I'll send it in this week. But too bad. Joke's on you, I'm still here, you still gotta hear what I have to say about it. It's the way the cookie crumbles, people. <laughs> no, they all knew that there was no way I was doing the podcast without you. They're like, might as well send it in because I know he'll get to it when he gets back. I, okay, it just lined up, all right? my uh -huh. I didn't even know this. My wife has, has gone away on a business trip. Right. She hasn't been away on a business trip three years, maybe more. I can't even remember the last time she went away uh, for any length of time that didn't involve taking us with her. Mm -hmm. And I think the last time she went away was in Australia, to be honest with you. But oh, wow. the yep. time before that, we went with her because it was only up to Georgia, and we're like, well, we're all going to go. Uh, and it was during the summer. So she left, and I'm like, well, this sucks. I mean, I got all these kids, and they hate me. <laughs> with that part's my fault, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got I got to own that one. I, I mean, they are I, your kids. It, it well, tends to I be just, a reflection. <laughs> I just, I just can't. Mm -hmm. I can't sit there and let them be selfish little awful human beings, which is what <laughs> kids are, without calling them out on it. They're like, Dad, that's not fair. I'm like, listen, just stop it. Like, I wish mom was here. She yeah. would take my I, side. I've heard I'm some like, people she, make that she comment. Would... Like, do you want everyone to walk around in public like they've got their mom looking over their shoulder? I'm like. Yeah, that really wouldn't be so bad if that's how people <laughs> behaved. If that got people to be a little bit better. Oh, my God. <laughs> so many things I, I have found out just like, I mean, not recently, but just in the last couple of years. That been, just today I was reading an article about uh, female climbers, you know, rock climbers, because I, I rock climb. Female climbers and the harassment they receive online for being well, female. Yes, put female and anything after That's, that word, and they it, receive a ridiculous amount of harassment online. You know? Oh, it's it's just it's just obscene. I honestly, when I started like a hashtag, but I couldn't figure out what to make like a like a like I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Hashtag. I think there hashtag, already was I, one. I point. didn't do it, but I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I I I mean, I've mansplained. Everybody has. <laughs> I mean, I've been mansplained to by women. It's happened. I mean, I, I've sat there and you know had some <laughs> woman at the climbing gym tell me how to do a thing. I'm like, sure. First of all, I've been climbing since you were pretty much in diapers, so thank you. But at the same time, shut up. Uh, so I mean, everybody's done that, so I don't really feel that bad. I've never taken a picture of any part of my body and sent it to somebody else. Yeah, that is weird. I've never thought that my wife has never received a picture like that. And honestly, if she did, she would slap me. She would be so mad. She once deleted our entire text chain message from like years. Not the text itself that she sent, I uh, sent that had the curse word in it that she didn't like. The all of it. She just like, I burned it all. <laughs> like, Jesus woman, I'm sorry. I was just joking. Just like, I didn't think it was funny. But like, clearly. So, I mean, I've never done that. I've never told somebody that the only reason that they're popular is because they're a girl never thought that i mean this I is an odd understand. tangent where 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 are we going with this? I, I don't know where we're going with this <laughs> i'm extremely You're like we don't have any time tired. to answer all these questions and this is off this is we what, go we're gonna talk about this instead Apparently. see this is what you get we're taking the week off rob Oh, we're I not see. gonna talk about we're not gonna talk about AV this week. <laughs> we're gonna talk about social media. Ah. Boy, won't thank us a lot of uh, listeners. Well, I was off with my sister and her kids up at uh, Hot Springs. Beautiful How? weather. It's fantastic. Do you mind sharing the age of the children? Uh sure. It was so uh, seven and sixteen now. Oh well, one of them can be terrible. The seven is probably one's all right. How's the sixteen-year-old? Oh, he's they... he's super calm. 
All right. Cool. He's not the problem no, at all. Oh, good. <laughs> Ever. No. On anything. You see, my, my 15-year-old is super de- duper laid back and stuff, but he's still, you know, as his parents... Like everybody else is like, man, he's so, he's so easy to get along with. I mean, yeah. If you don't if you don't want him to ever do anything, then he's great <laughs> to get along with. If you want him to help you do some stuff, he's happy to do that. But if you say, finish this thing that you need to finish for your life because it's good for you, not going to happen. And there I am, bad dad again. <laughs> All right, this is AV Rant, the podcast that talks about your social media woes and children issues. And also AV and home theater. So it is. if you want your question answered about all of those things, email us at question at avrant.com. You can catch us on uh, www.avrant.com, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant, where you can see our videos. And uh, contact us directly, Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. All right, uh, let's thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week and to support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is by going to www.avrant.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. You can do that. will take you to a PayPal donation site. And we want to thank Adam for giving us a PayPal donation. Thank you, Adam. Yes, Adam, thank you very much for that donation. We appreciate it. Those monies go into our coffers to help pay for hosting fees and other such things. You know, this kind of stuff that uh, keeps this podcast going, greases the wheels and all that. We also have want to thank our 80 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon's a service where you can sign up for a monthly uh, sustaining membership, sort of a subscription model, mm-hmm. if you will, to our podcast, where you set the amount of money for the subscription as long as it's a dollar or more. So thank you to our 80 patrons. Yep, that's Patreon.com slash Podcast if you'd like to sign up. And thanks very much to our 80 patrons over there. Yeah. Uh, let's see here in the news. Many AV Rant listeners pinged us about the Netflix announcement of studio quality sound. Mm-hmm. Officially, it's called high quality audio, which should actually probably be called higher than crappy quality audio. <laughs> it's not high. Uh, and it began all began when Duffer Brothers uh, go to hear Stranger Things 2 played in the actual living room. They noticed it didn't sound as clear and crisp as when they had mastered it on their dubbing stage. Who would have thought? So Netflix has now increased their audio bandwidth. It's uh, still Dolby Digital Plus, but now it's adaptive to your internet bandwidth. And if you've got the bandwidth, it'll top out at 640 kilobits per second instead of the old 192 Mm. uh, for all 5.1 content. And if you're subscribed to the premium plan, which I am, and you're watching something that offers Dolby Atmos, which I have, and now it now tops out at 768 kilobits per second instead of the old 448 kilobits per second. And Mark wants to know if there's any harder restrictions and whether his this applies to all Netflix content or only Netflix originals. And Earl wants to know if we've heard the difference uh, for ourselves. He swears he knows the difference in Christmas dynamics while watching Daredevil. Daredevil? And that was just... Uh, but was that just the placebo? Or do we think we heard a difference now too? I mean, I haven't re I haven't time to rewatch anything for an AB <laughs> sort of thing. And since this was not... This was a time thing that happened, like... You know, at an instant, it went from something to something. I didn't notice any difference. I did binge watch the entire Love, Death, Robots. Oh yeah, I saw that anthology series. Haven't watched any of it. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's like watching a movie. Basically, it's like mm. you know, ten episodes or fifteen episodes, and they're all like fifteen, ten to fifteen minutes long. Okay. So, I mean, you can power through it in a night, which is what I did. Uh, it was pretty good. I mean, there's a little bit more. I mean, and it, it, coming from a person who doesn't mind gratuitous nudity it seemed like a little gratuitous in some of the scenes <laughs> like i don't mind it but i was like you know i don't know i think people should sometimes wear clothes just i mean in the future i think Netflix, they will we are not disney plus that's right <laughs> i think they'll wear clothes in the future that's what i think the robot one like the straight up robot one that had the uh three robots on vacation was hilarious oh okay <laughs> it was awesome and that's like one of the early ones so you can catch that one so well, i that. i didn't get a chance to watch any netflix so uh so i i haven't heard the difference for myself if it's there um so yeah going back to mark's questions about any hardware restrictions there shouldn't be because they haven't changed anything yeah, about the yeah. formats that are coming out if you have an older device that couldn't output dolby digital plus and just resorted to regular dolby digital 640 kilobits will still fit in a vanilla Dolby Digital signal, and I'm certain that's what it's going to use. That's the maximum bit rate for a vanilla mm-hmm. Dolby Digital. Dolby Digital Plus could actually go as high as 1.5 megabits per second, so they're not even maxing out what Dolby Digital Plus can do. Um, I mean, I'm all for this. I don't think we have to worry that much about, like, 
hundreds of kilobits per second? Is that really going to be the difference? But if it is, even if it is, even if you're on a highly restrictive internet connection, it does adapt just like the video does, right? The video well, will lower yeah. itself in resolution if your internet bandwidth slows down. So this will lower the bit rate of the audio if you have a uh, band, you know, internet slowdown. So that's fine. It'll continue to function and it should sound. I mean, this is like going from a 64 kilobit per second AAC to like 192 kilobit per second AAC. And that's that's usually can be no noticed if you're listening yeah. for it well i mean definitely in the a b situation but it'd be extremely hard to a b this now i i do want to say that i here in the united states and in canada you know unlimited plans are pretty much ubiquitous i mean we don't really have plans that are you know yeah, quite a few people have data caps and that so australia when i was in australia data caps were a real problem mm -hmm. i mean it was a real issue so uh it, it's a little dismissive for us not to to say oh, that I it, see. It's, yeah that's that, a, that, yeah if there's a if, if there isn't a way for the user to say oh actually well, keep it and that's low. what i want to mm -hmm. say is that i think that even if it's if you have to go into like the computer to your computer uh your your account and and say this is as high a bandwidth as I want to have. Right. I think that mm. should be an option hmm. uh, because there are users out there that are under restrictions that you know may, we don't really think about as much. You know. And yeah, no mention of that. So maybe that's a feature that if enough people speak up about it, could they should could potentially I, get added. Yeah. I, I don't like I don't like them just. Say, I mean, for me, it's great. I don't care. I mean, I, yes, give me all the bandwidth. Give yeah. it. Give it all to me. I'm great. Uh, I don't stream. I mean. I stream YouTube all the time, but I don't, you know, I don't have any sort of restrictions on what I do. But if I did, and I did when I was in Australia, I would definitely want that ability to throttle that back manually myself and say, okay, this is good enough yeah. for me. But it is weird that like their own headline on their own blog post called it studio quality sound. And yet they're like, the official name of this is high quality audio because it is still lossy. So <laughs> it isn't actually studio quality sound because it's not lossless and they're right. right up front with that. So that was a little whatever. But um, yeah, no, Mark's other question the is- The marketing that, uh, guys insisted on calling it studio quality. But right, we just yeah, want yeah, you to yeah. know that it's not yeah, really, not just actually, that's what that's the name high, of it. It's bit studio quality in quotes. But uh, yeah, Mark's <laughs> other question, uh, in their own release, they're like, this is this is for all of our content at this point. So they yeah. nothing about restricting it just to Netflix originals. Right. See why they would. All right, Samsung for is for real launching a TV that you can use in vertical mode. It's called the Cero, and they flat out said it's for the millennial generation, which is the most dismissive, awful, that is, terrible thing. That is ridiculous. It's so irritating. It's so irritating. There are millennials I, I, who are grandparents at this point already. I mean, yes, that, they would have been young, both them and their children true. having kids, but that that is the case, so... It's it's very very millennials. For millennials. So I actually I I, I wrote <laughs> I, I'm a member of Toastmasters, which is a organization that many of you probably know of that does you know a public speaking and that sort of thing. It's supposed to help you do public speaking. For me, it's more of a just fun club I go to, and I did a speech on millennials and how <laughs> millennials are the worst. And then I put a bunch of quotes up there, and there are all these quotes about every other generation mm -hmm. other than millennials, but I didn't attribute them right away. Yes, yeah. And like the last one I put up there was like from Aristotle complaining about young people. Yep. <laughs> like it's that's what we do. We complain <laughs> about young people. This is stupid, and the person who thought of it is dumb, and the person who named it is the worst. So I hate all of this. I mean, <laughs> I just is it is it literally for plugging in your phone and streaming your pictures yep. it is for from casting your from your phone in vertical mode to a vertically aligned television people who take pictures in vertical mode are the worst in yeah. ways that millennial or no i don't care who you are because i tell i gotta tell you right now you know who does take a vertical mode my parents mm -hmm. they do not understand horizontal yeah. i'm like come on I do like the people who start that way and then mid video turn the camera <laughs> sideways, but of course it doesn't realign itself at that point. You no, just have doesn't. a sideways video now. Yeah, a sideways video. Oops. All right, in the comments here, David. Uh, when David heard us talk about the inability to extend the wireless range of Xbox One controllers, he immediately so thought of software-defined radio as a possible solution. A quick uh, Google search didn't turn up any Xbox One controller repeater hacks, but David thinks this is a project that the SDR enthusiast community might be able to solve. Yeah, it's still kind of against the law. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know next to nothing about yeah. this, but I, I didn't find any. Uh, I actually kind of was surprised because I was like, oh, yeah, somebody probably has done this, but uh, didn't 
I mean, that was only a quick cursory Google search, so maybe somebody out there has, but it wasn't easily found that way. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you right now, that's not going to be enough water for this podcast, man. I, I mean, if... <laughs> If you, if, you, <laughs> if you can capture someone's uh, remote car starter as they're pressing it and then repeat that to their car later, which is something software defined radio is used for, uh, you should definitely be able to do something with an Xbox controller. Yeah, really. These are definitely the people level. you want to get helping you on things. Mm. <laughs> just Sorry. tell us your address and banking routing number <laughs> just and we'll take, get right just, on it. Just, yeah. just take a picture of the front and back of your credit card. Uh, don't, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm sure they're very nice people. I'm, I apologize in advance or in actually post-mortem for insulting yeah. you. I'm sorry. Uh, Billy, uh, partially hit, he hit our advice and partially ignored it. For his very small and closed dedicated theater, we tried to talk him down from getting dual SVS PB3000 subs, saying that dual SB1000s would be sufficient. But we'd happily recommend the dual SB2000s or even SB3000s if he just wants the fancy app features. So we convinced him that PP3000s would be overkill, but after talking with SVS and explaining how he wanted a lot more impact and tactile feel, along with better detail than uh, his dual 12-inch clip subs were providing, they suggested going with ported subs, and he landed on dual PP2000s. He loves them. Good. Yeah. Yep. And they fit just fine in the front left corner, rear right corner, so a happy conclusion and some mind-blowing bass. Good job, buddy. That's fine. He I, also we... did, as I requested, send in a pic of his uh, Klipsch Atmos module, but mounted on his side wall as a regular surround speaker. Just yeah, just working as a regular wall-mounted surround speaker, but with its little angle being used to angle it down towards his listening position. So, uh, yeah, that that's great, Billy. I am very happy that you are happy more than anything else. Those do fit nicely just below your screen and tucked in the corners there, so I can... I can fully imagine how a pair of PB2000s in that room size, enclosed, is delivering all the bass you could ever need. Yes, that's right. They're, they're, they're sitting there with their volume level turned to 1.2. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, for anyone that wanted to camouflage a subwoofer, SVS posted some photos on Instagram from artist at GraphConfusion. Uh, Yep. Whatever. Who printed up a custom wrap for his PC 2000 cylinder to turn it into a giant yummy roll, not a. Yes, he's, well, he's not violating any trademarks, but yes, you can right. see what this was influenced by. Yeah. What is, is that? Is it, what is that? The, what is that? What are, the, what are they normally called? Not Tootsie gum, rolls? Tootsie rolls. God, no. I just. But I, I like this a lot. I mean, the, the way this I wanted looks... to say gummy roll for some reason. I could not not say it. It was like, what? Get out of my head. I know it's not a gummy roll. Shut up. No, roll, nobody yes. is going to look at this thing and go, oh, that is clearly a subwoofer. You know, no. if you didn't know, yeah, that, that's it's great. It's not camouflage. a subwoofer. Who knows what the heck it is? <laughs> One of your friends might take a bite out of it. But yeah. All right, let's I mean, get to the you, questions here. A, uh, finally. If you went to a big uh, like poster shop or something like that, they should be able to print you up something that you could wrap around a sub, right? So. I mean, the sides of the subs aren't Not ported. Not 16 inch diameter. So it's yeah, you just just take the measurement and just yeah. you know glue it on or whatever. That's right. All right, here we go. The questions, Matt. Matt started working on his basement home theater years ago, but then life got in the way, so now he's back at it. Boy, how many times do we hear that? Like a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he has finished framing the room, but before he puts up the drywall, he wants to run all the wires and the HVAC. Excuse me. So he'd like some help planning exactly where all his gear should go. He's planned for fairly extensive soundproofing. Double stud walls have already been framed. The ceiling will be hung on sound clips and hat channels. And I feel like we've read this question before. <laughs> and he'll be putting up double drywall with uh, green glue. He's framed for a false wall up uh, front with a minimum of two feet of space behind it. The foundation wall juts out a bit for extra uh for a portion of the physical front wall. And of course, that means he'll have an acoustically transparent screen. The overall length of the room is 39 and a half feet. The overall width is 14 uh, feet, three inches. And the most, uh, most of the ceiling is just under six, uh, I'm sorry, eight feet tall. Mm -hmm. So seven foot 11. Uh, so 13 feet, 10 inches from his false wall, there's a support beam on the ceiling that runs the entire width of the room from side to side. Below that beam, the height is seven feet, two inches. Just behind the beam, there are doors. Uh, on the left wall and on the right wall, the rear left corner of the total space has a half bathroom that's about seven and a half by seven and a half. So that uh, breaks up the physical back wall uh, of the total space, but he still has oodles of room behind where his theater seats will go. Where is the picture of this thing? Oh, I see. Yep. 
Yeah, okay. So in the rear left corner of the room as a whole, you got a bathroom taken up there, so you don't have a, a you know, just a s solid flat back wall. There's right. the jut out for the bathroom area, but it's still it's 39 and a half feet long, this total space. And right. he's basically using 15 feet of that for his theater up front. So plenty of room still behind him. Okay, he only wants one row of theater seats. They don't have tons of people over all the time, so there's no point in installing a permanent second row. He would like to have bar stools in the bar area behind his theater seats, but the rest of the back of the room, he's left up to his wife to do as she pleases. And he was thinking he'd like to sit 10 or 11 feet from the screen. Which is great. That's going to work out swimmingly well for you. Great. Right. All right. Uh, it seems like the side, like, I think he's got, is that the HVAC? What is that? HVAC? There is a, a heating duct that is uh, about seven and a half feet behind the full width beam. Uh, uh. But the heat HVAC duct that is there, it's not as deep as the beam and it doesn't go all the way across the room. So it's just this smaller soffit in the back of the room. But it's really, it shouldn't affect the theater area in any way, that extra little HVAC. Dude, beam. if it were me, I would make the bar like, the the bar come out from the wall directly you know next to or to uh, or across from the bathroom that so makes that, sense that just have that have the bathroom and basically the wall the bar area be this right next to the bathroom the same size yep. so it's flush and then in be neck in front of that pool table mm. and in front of that home theater done that makes sense <laughs> that makes to me that's what i would do this is this is just looking at this thing that's what i would do but whatever all right, here we go. What size screen and aspect ratio would we recommend? 16 by 9. Oh, uh, should he get a screen with masking? I don't think you're going to have an option, so yes. He'd go for a manual ma masking option from Seymour that uses masking panels with magnets if, if he were to get any mask, any type, uh, masking of any type. So he doesn't want, like, automated stuff. Um, so the masking he was talking about, he wasn't talking about, like, a border. He was talking about the masking thing. So, yeah, if you're going to go 16 by 9... Or if you want the masking whole deal, mm. what Rob's going to tell you, which is insanity in its finest, is you, <laughs> you want the uh, 2.35 to 1 screen. No. Yes. Yes. And then you're going to mask off the sides for 16 by 9. For HDTV. That's for one way to come at it. I would only tell you to do that if you never to plan to watch anything that's in IMAX format and never plan to watch anything with subtitles. Um, yeah. So I'm not super duper in favor of going with a 2.35 to 1 screen. Um, I you mean, go 16, so the other option Rob's going to tell you is get the big 16 by 9 big as big 16, as you can the get. The IMAX 16 by 9. That's right. And then you mask it off for 2.35 to 1. Maybe. And then when you're, when you're not watching... Yeah, when you're watching HDTV and you want you, a smaller you 16 by 9. You mask it off again. You either get four-way masking or you get a second screen that's motorized and comes down and is smaller that comes down in front of your other screen. Oh, that You could do a two-screen solution. Uh, honestly, I'm going to tell you to get a 16 by 9 screen. I think yeah, you should make too. it 120 inches diagonal. Okay. Because 120 inches diagonal from 10 and a half feet away is a 45-degree viewing angle. And you wanted to be 10 or 11 feet away. I'm like, well, 10 and a half fits in there just right. And then, since I know his next concern is where his projector is going to go, it's actually all going to work out really nicely if you go with a 120-inch 16 by 9 screen. Now, if you just have it in your head that you're like, I don't care about IMAX being taller than my CinemaScope movies. I'm not concerned about subtitles possibly going down into the frame of my screen. And you're just like, I am set on getting a cin uh, CinemaScope 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio screen. Make it the same width as what a 120 inch 16 by 9 screen would be. So it's actually going to be smaller than 120 right. inches, but it's going to be the same width. And then, yeah, you could do the side panel masking so that your 16 by 9 is smaller, but. Honestly, I'm like, just get the 16 by 9 screen, and that way you can watch IMAX that way. You don't have to worry about subtitles. And the projectors that you're looking at do very nice black bars of their own. So CinemaScope still looks fantastic, even when it's the projector making the black bars. It's like my words are coming out of your mouth. Yeah. It's weird. No, the only weird thing is HDTV being bigger than CinemaScope. That's, That's the only not weird. weird. 
It's I mean, that's what every flat be panel does. So big yeah. as possible. Yeah. yeah. He's thinking the Epson 5050 UB for a projector, but there should be. But where should he plan on mounting it? He's cons concerned about that support beam. I'd be concerned about whether I can mount it on the support beam. Yeah, <laughs> or and right it's in also front only, of the support you know, seven beam. Seven foot so. two below that beam. That's true. It's a not but right in front beam. of the support beam would be nice. And that's another reason why 120 inches diagonal <laughs> works out really nice because the 5050 UB, I think that's a great choice. You know, right now at full MSRP, it's $3,000. So it's definitely less expensive than the JVC X790, which would be the next choice at thirty-eight to four, uh, thirty-eight hundred to four thousand dollars. Uh, but yeah, if you don't want to spend that much. Uh, 3000 and that price should drop down to 2700 quite quickly because the Epsons always do. Uh, so getting that, uh, that projector is a great choice. And then the body of that projector is under 18 inches from front to back. It's 17.7 inches from front to back for the body of that projector. Right. And then its lens uh, has to be at least 11 feet 9 inches from the screen to throw a 120-inch diagonal image. Now, yeah, two feet in front of the front wall for the screen, right? At yeah, least so two, two feet, feet in front of the front wall, but that's it's almost 16 feet from the physical front wall to the beam. Right. And it's almost 14 feet from the screen to the beam. So even if you say it's 12 feet from the lens to the screen... Yeah. That's still factor you... in connections at the back of the thing. It is, but I mean the, the it's not it's not uh you know close to being two feet for the body no. of the projector. It's a foot and a half. So regardless you got at least six inches of space behind the back of this projector to the actual beam, yeah. if that's where you mount it. Uh so yeah, just make sure that with your ceiling mount that you install and where you have the cables run, that you're going to be able to have the lens of the projector at least 11 feet, 9 inches, and give that a couple inches more because you don't want to be right literally against the maximum Why you just attach it to the beam? Because then it'd be so low. I'm, I, I'm saying not, no. I'm oh, saying attach it to the put, front of the beam. Yeah, put a shelf on the turn of the beam. But, it's I, beam. but the beam isn't just... quite tall enough to make that a perfect choice, I don't think. So it's gonna, it's still, it's gonna be lower than the beam with on the on the mount. It might be a, a little bit like the very bottom of the projector might be a little bit lower than the beam. Uh, I don't know. I feel like you could. It's gonna be very close. Yeah, I think you could just put a shelf up there. Too. A shelf? Yeah, you could. But I mean, a ceiling mount is just as easy once you're up there. So, yeah. In, in other words, though, this projector, the Epson 5050 UB, can definitely fit in front of that support beam and throw you a 120-inch image. So that's how it works out nicely. Yeah. He's thinking he'd like a 7.2.4 Atmos speaker, speaker setup, but he's unsure where the surround back speakers would go. The physical back wall is so very far away. And with the half bath and the rear corner, the speakers mounted on the back wall would either be up uh, really close together in the middle, or they'd be significantly different distances. One on the foundation wall, 37 feet away from the screen, the other on the back. Bathroom wall, 30 feet away from the screen. Should you do some configuration other than 7.2.4, or can we recommend a good place to put a surround back speakers? Dude, I would never do 7.2.4. <laughs> this with one row of seats, not a chance. I would do 5.2.4, or I mean, you could actually go ahead and wire for 5.2.6 and just assume that someday you're going to get a mm. receiver that can do the thing. Mm. <clears throat> that's, might as well. that's possible. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not in favor in this particular setup of actually mounting speakers at the back of this room. If you were going to do surround back speakers, I'd be like, <coughs> well, could you put them on stands? And from what you've described of wanting either like a bar area or something else going on behind the theater, I'm thinking stands are probably not a super go-to. Now, I mean, well, the beam isn't far enough behind you to really make that a good place to hang right. surround back speakers from because it's only no. a couple feet behind your seats. So, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I guess if you were going to do it, you'd have to hang them from the ceiling somehow. I wouldn't do and in ceiling surround backs. That doesn't make any sense to me when you're going to have top rears. Right. I wouldn't. I'd do 5.2.6. Yeah. I'd, I'd go mm. ahead and wire for six. That'd be okay. And do, you know, top fronts, top middles, top rears. And then, you know, go ahead and whatever receiver you buy today you're going to get top fronts and top rears yeah and then yeah you know 5.2.4 well, if he gets an x8500h he can do top middles right now along with top fronts and top rears 
I know, but he's not gonna because he's probably not gonna not. Be, he's gonna be spending. That's very expensive. So any best practices you should, should follow as far as placing acoustic treatments. It's a very big room. You have it a is. lot of wall space, which means as much as possible. <laughs> uh, if you decide, which I really think you should, to put the bar at the back of this room, okay, uh, with, uh, it makes the most sense to me. But if you decide to do that then resist the urge to take and put a big fat mirror on that back wall. Because <laughs> a lot of people would do that. Uh, so coming to mind here, you know what you want is as much absorption as you can get. And if you can't get absorption, as much diffusion as you can get. So one of the th- one place that there's a, here in town, and I'm sorry, I cannot remember the name of this bar, but there's a bar in town. And I wanted to call it the library or the reading room or something like that. And they just literally have books everywhere like everything Mm. is books like your check comes in a book in you know a leather like a leather bound or you know hard bound book that's you know an old book that they just picked up someplace or whatever the walls are wallpapered in books there's like books everywhere so you know it's all sorts of different shapes and sizes and the books themselves some of them are open some of them are not and that sort of thing but my wife we went to there and then a couple of weeks later we went to a different place and she was like, ah, I cannot hear anything in here. Mm. It's so very loud, blah, blah. I'm like, look around. It's nothing about hard surfaces as far as you yeah. can see. Of course you get. So well, well, how come the other place was so nice? I'm like, because they had books everywhere, you know, breaking up just the sound waves, breaking up the sound yeah. wave. So you could literally call it your, your reading room or your library or something like that. And just do something similar to that. And just have this idea of just, you know, different shaped sizes books open them up have some like they had like books pulled out and used them as shelves to put bottles of liquor on stuff like that so i'm not saying that you steal this idea from them or whatever you know take it from me but you know something come up with an idea that doesn't involve a hard flat glass surface on the back wall (laughs) something that will at least diffuse the sound uh it'll be better for your bar peoples and it'll also be just overall better for the home theater yeah as far as best practices uh what you want to do total up all the surface area so that's your floor your ceiling and your four walls take that surface area and try to make about 30 percent of it absorptive and or diffusive you want to make at yeah. least about 30, well, you're aiming to make about 30% of your room not be hard and flat surfaces. Uh, we so no- step one is big uh, carpet it with thick pad underneath the carpet. Yeah, yeah it's you know, easy that to at least that, that's a good step. Cover a good portion of the floor. Uh, you could go for this being a basement. I don't know if you're doing a suspended ceiling, but if you are, go for actual acoustic ceiling tiles because that can help to absorb some sound that way in a way right. that easily hides. You're not noticing it when it's on the ceiling. Uh, normally, we are concerned about the back wall because most people have a back wall close to at least maybe if they have a second row of seats, that. But in your case, we're not concerned about the back wall. So we're going to put treatments on the side walls, uh, get those first reflection points and uh, then maybe on the front wall as well, which is easy in your case because you have a false wall. So definitely all of the physical front wall that's behind your false wall, that should just be uh, insulation because it doesn't even look need to look pretty. You're covering it with a false wall. Right. So all of that front wall should be insulation and that'll help out and hide a lot of, of covering that surface area in your room. If you could just basically fill that whole space you don't have to fill it but <laughs> it would be great but that whole physical front wall you can just yep. put insulation over it and easy doesn't have to look pretty at all all right adam adam and his wife live in an apartment they both care about sound quality but they don't have room where they can uh, don't have a room that they can make into a dedicated theater they have to make do with their living room they're using a 65 inch oled apparent uh Perian varus grand bookshelf front left and right speakers appearing varus forte center and for varus forte satellite surrounds the sub is svs pb1 thousand and he's got a denon x3400 h so he just got that and so he's using odyssey multi qxc32 for the first time they have two love seats arranged into an l shape his wife prefers to sit in the seat that is directly facing the tv because she does in fact like good sound mm-hmm. adam prefers to sit on the sideways facing seat on the left so he can stretch out a bit with his legs up because he cares more about comfort than good sound there is that so since both love seats are primary seats, how should he aim his speakers? If he focuses solely on the seat that's directly facing the TV, won't he end up with compromised sounds as he's sitting far over to the far left? Yes, you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if, that's your choice, sir. If you, if you tow in the speakers on either side of the TV so that they are nicely aligned to give excellent imaging at the seat that is directly facing them on couch number one that is directly yep. facing the TV, uh, it will be compromised sound on couch number two that's over on the left-hand side. That. That's that is right. just a fact. Um, 
Now, I mean, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but I, I came up with an idea of perhaps rearranging this room. This is not to scale, and oh, I whipped this up fast in Microsoft Paint, so it is a work of art to behold if you want to see Are you showing me the YouTube this? video I see of it? it. It's down there at the bottom under D. Uh, but oh. I was thinking, can you turn this into a corner arrangement? Oh, well, yeah, I guess. Where you actually put the television bridging the physical corner that's down what what is currently the corner created by your two love seats uh put the tv over there bridging that corner instead and then yes uh i'm imagining that in his original picture that uh, over to the right is open you know to the rest of the room because apartment set up it pretty much has to be right? right uh so in this case you would have a couch that is now in in that open area on the right but that's usually okay. People are able to walk around a couch, right? So if you go for a corner arrangement, now you can have both of your seats within the you know dispersion cone of your front left and right speakers. Whereas with your current setup, unless you somehow angle that television stand, it's going to be going to be a bit difficult. Uh, not impossible. You could actually treat it so that you figure out what the dispersion cone of your speakers are and you angle them such that both of your seats are within that cone. It's just that it's going to be aiming essentially at your back corner between your two seats. Um, so that that's okay, but that's how you would have to angle your speakers to hit both couches, uh, both right. seats so being I, within the dispersion I, cone. Regardless of whether or not Rob's got the location of the... Yeah. The, the corner correct it doesn't matter find a corner straddle yeah. the tv yeah and then you know make it so that the, the 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 two couches come together directly in front of the tv and then you both put your heads on the inside of that <laughs> to the you apex know. of the triangle created right. by your two couches yeah uh which is a solution the other solution is just go sit with your wife you weirdo. there is that that's, <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's another possibility I mean, hey, both oh, just uh, sit on couch one and you get on, an ottoman so you can put your feet up that's right honestly i understand you know compromised sound quality you know i sit in here i sit uh, the, the kids all know that i sit a little bit to the left of the center of the couch because mm -hmm. a little bit to the left of the center of the couch is dead on the center channel and that's where i sit everybody sits around me you want to sit the couch you got to sit around me now when i'm in here and i'm relaxing or whatever i don't sit there you know i might lie down my head's gonna be way off to the side you know, it doesn't matter because I'm I'm not watching for critical listening. I'm not you know, not worried that much about the sound experience. So that's okay. But also, don't I don't get up and start repositioning my speakers so that my speakers now I'm in between the cone of whatever. No, you decide to sit on the left. Then that's your that's your business. You don't get to have this. <laughs> you don't get to have the speakers facing you if you do that. that I mean, you, you could. It would just. It would look a little odd because they'd be aiming differently what? than the television. But it would. It would function all right, and you would have to take into account the distance settings. You know, that front right speaker is going to have a longer distance setting than the front left speaker. But that's that's what that's. But there when you for how do you run Odyssey that. at that point? Where's well, your that's, Odyssey? Well, that's his next point? question. So let's yeah. hit that. Yeah. So how should he position the Odyssey mic for the eight measurements it can take? He knows that we said to put the mic in the primary seat for measurement one and then keep the mic within a two-foot radius for all of the measurements. But again, he cares a lot about that sideways-facing seat on the left. So shouldn't at least some of the mic positions take that into account? And the answer is really no. It, it <laughs> is no. And in fact... Uh, it's, a pr it's an emphatic no. It'll screw up everything, you'll, honestly. You'll very likely get better... Like, even if you kept everything as is, the speakers facing forward right. really only... Uh, optimally set up for couch number one that's directly facing the TV, even if you kept it exactly like that, still measuring in the way that we described for Odyssey, you the I, I wish we could get away from this idea of seats as being measurement positions. It has Well, they call it that. That's, I know. There, there's just nothing there's no But way it has almost that. nothing to do with seats. List, uh, measurement position number one has to be where the perfect stereo imaging should take place. It has to be the midpoint between your front left and right speakers. That's right. Your that, wife's lap. Right. Is is. That is measurement position number one. It, it has to do with Wife. where the speakers should be having their ideal stereo imaging. It has nothing to do with seats. Because if you do my corner setup idea, measurement position number one is essentially going to be the like 
corner where the two couches meet where no one right. is actually sitting but that right. is still measurement position number one because that is where the ideal stereo imaging would be happening and then you still only measure in a two foot radius bubble around measurement position number one and the surprising thing is even though you didn't take any measurements in your actual seats you still get better results in your actual seats that way right. because the equalization can work properly when you take the measurements properly so it's a change in mindset but mic position number one is where optimal stereo imaging would be happening based on the positioning of your front left and right speakers and then and stay moving within the mic around level. is telling odyssey what's happening with the room yeah around that position not your seats it doesn't care and about if there's a seats. lot of stuff if there's a lot of differences and variations mm. in there then it tells it how much it can or cannot affect the sound if there's a lot of variations then there's not a lot it can do if there's very few variations then there's a lot it can mm -hmm. do if that makes sense yep. but you take that mic and you're like but i should over here so i put it over here next to this window yeah. Right, <laughs> you know, or or a wall or something like that, and suddenly it's like, whoa, this this measurement is way out of whack. That means that I can't affect any frequency that's being messed up because of this was one measurement. Yeah. Well, now suddenly your your measurements are all askew because of it. All right, so he's got a PV one thousand sub and. and on the left wall, he put his back. It put its back against the left wall, so its driver and port are fire, firing sideways across the room. Is that okay? Facing it any other way would have it firing into a wall or into the side of the love seat. Don't fire into the wall. It doesn't care if it fires into a love seat. I mean, you might like that. Who knows? It might vibrate it a little bit. <laughs> uh, but you know, as long as it's yeah, it's fine. Just it doesn't matter what wall. way you face it. Think about a downward firing sub. It's firing yeah. downward into the floor and then sound is radiating in every direction as large, yeah. long bass waves do no matter which way you face the sub. So what you got is totally fine. If you go for the corner placement, the convenient place to now put that sub is behind the television in the corner that's now opened up from that straddled television. So that could be another option if you change the orientation. So the surround speakers are directly to the sides of the forward-facing love seats. So he angled the left surround, thinking at least some of the sound would be kind of going towards his sideways-facing seat that way. <laughs> Man, dude, just get up and, you know what? Buy a new love seat that reclines. <laughs> that fixes all of this. It kind of does. A two-seater, both seats recline. I mean, is, she by, side by side. is she gassy or something? Is that the problem? <laughs> I mean, he is. Maybe he is, and she doesn't want to sit next to him. Maybe right. you go take a shower, get you over there. animal. Oh, uh, dear. I just think showers fix a lot of things in relationships, <laughs> just in general. I had a, a, a guy one time tell me, he goes, you know what, Tom? No one ever got, no one ever got, what did he say? No one ever got divorced while washing the dishes. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> be, be helpful. Take a shower. Uh, anyways, uh, so, 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 some of the way of aiming the surround speakers. Um yeah, don't, I mean, again, this is right back to the initial thing. I mean, you start facing that thing towards you, and then what What exactly good is that doing you? That's what I don't quite understand. You're I mean, now going to get direct sound from that, from that left surround speaker, so what good does that do? My solution here, if you're keeping the setup you have, is you actually take that left surround speaker and put it, kind of more or less above your subwoofer so that it's look, actually, i go back and look at this thing yeah. yeah it's it's actually to the side like you treat the two seats as though they are just a, a single v seat and then you have the two surround speakers to the outsides of that total v uh which is more or less what i've shown in this you know mock-up of, of a corner placement that you actually end up with the surround yeah, speakers but are you saying in his current setup you would put it next to the subwoofer i would put it like above like above the subwoofer and then, and then so firing the, down at the corner. And then the other one's on the other The other couch, one where it is, firing, firing the way at, it is. Yeah. At the corner. That's a, I guess that's fine. Yeah. It actually puts the surround speaker like within spit and difference of the front left speaker. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, for for the seats that he's arranged, that's that's the correct way to set up. That's the way you'd set up a corner a corner placement, like what I'm proposing that he change it to. Yeah. Well. I, I just leave it where it is, and you suffer for not sitting in the right seat. There is that that's as well. What, that's what I say. All right. Uh, Alvin. Alvin asked a couple of questions. That we, uh, I'm sorry. A couple of weeks ago about that top S-series models in Denon's receiver lineup. 
and versus the bottom X series models. One thing he would like to be able to do is connect an older game system using analog video and have it convert to HDMI output uh, to both his flat panel and his projector so that the top S series models can do all that. The bottom X series models cannot. So we said to go with the S930, even though it has Odyssey Multi-Q instead of the Multi-Q XT. But now he's back to say that he actually has several old game systems and always had it in mind that it would be cool if there's a way to have them all hooked up so that any of them could be played at any time. To that end, is there a device he could use to plug in several analog video game systems, switch them between an IR remote and convert the output to HDMI? He's thinking all of his analog video game systems could effectively be plugged into a single HDMI port on his receiver that way. Then he wouldn't need quite so many HDMI ports on the receiver and you wouldn't need to worry about analog to HDMI video conversion on the receiver itself. Dude, you're literally talking about the functions of a receiver. You spend more on a receiver, <laughs> and you can do this. You're, qu I mean, quite literally, you are taught. You're saying, I want the thing that the receiver does, but in a separate box, so I can plug it into a cheaper receiver. Wait, whatever the cheap the the box is going to cost. You well, probably I don't know, can just these. These boxes are very inexpensive. Well, which ones does he, he have? Do. I mean, what is he talking about? He's talking about like Atari 2600s or a bunch of things with components or what? Well, that's, yeah. The, I was only thinking about uh, the yellow composite plug uh, to do okay, this. I mean, so, so obviously there are just regular AV switches, RCA AV switches, yellow, red, white. I mean, there's one on Amazon for like 20 bucks that has eight in and one out. Um now, that one doesn't have an IR remote. You'd have to actually go up there and press the button to choose the input that you want. But I'm like, these are old video game systems. Don't you have to walk up to them to put a game into them and pick up the controller, which is wired anyway? So right, while you're right. up there, push the button. Um, but if you do want one with an IR remote, that does exist. I found one that's four in, one out that has an IR remote. Again, it's just an AV switch. This one actually has S video as well. So It doesn't do any video conversion, though. But that doesn't do any video conversion. That... That said, over at the wire cutter, they have a recommendation for a $15 device that takes audio video, yellow, red, white, and turns it into HDMI while upscaling it to 720p or 1080p, your choice. And it's like 15 bucks. So you take the AV switch, you take its one output, you feed it into the thing that converts it to HDMI, and that would do it. And you're, you're looking at like under 50 bucks for the combo of those two things. So how many game systems do you have? What's I don't know the, how many the, game the, systems he has. Yeah. I so I mean, number. this may or may not work, but yes. Yeah. Or you could just get a receiver that does it for you, and most of them. You, I, I mean, mean, if you're talking like four or five video game systems, a lot of receivers still do have about four, uh, you know, composite video inputs. Some of them don't, though. You know, some of them are down to like only two or even one, as far right. as analog video inputs go. So that that has changed. Uh, if you get an AV receiver that has very few analog video inputs but can at least do the analog to hdmi conversion then right. you're still just talking about getting a very inexpensive av switch right. and then that the output of that av switch feeds the one analog video input of the av receiver so either way this is a fairly inexpensive thing to do i would just say use an av switch and then something else is going to convert that av switch's output into hdmi whether it's a 15 dollars external box or the av receiver itself so he's still thinking about Atmos. He's in a rental at the moment, so he wouldn't be doing in ceilings or even want to mess with mounting speakers on the ceiling itself. So he's really only considering mounting speakers up high on this front wall and maybe on the back uh, or side walls too. Would that be all right to get just a taste of Atmos? I mean, you can. Yep. Uh, I mean, that's basically... It's front heights, rear heights. Or front heights, you know, middles. Or, yeah, front heights. Top middles. Top middles, but top middles that are on the side walls instead of actually on yeah, the ceiling. Yeah, so you could get like SVS's uh, prime, prime elevation speakers or just take the Atmos modules that somebody yeah. makes and slap <laughs> them on the wall. Pretty much any of the Atmos modules, they're like, instead of firing up, you just mount them high up on your wall and use the little angle to have them come down at you nicely as front heights. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, That's totally it. fine. So we mentioned the Onkyo 787 that can do 5.2.4 Atmos over accessory less. It's now down to 380. Mm -hmm. And the RZ630, which drops uh, THX but adds zone 2 HDMI output, is only 350. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the Onkyo RZ730, which has nine amplifiers built in but can be expanded to 7.2.4, is only 420. All of Cal uh, Alvin's speakers are Klipsch. So he isn't too worried about amplifier power. It wouldn't have to be anyways. He's uh, He'd have to save a, up a little bit... Uh, just a little bit, but these Onkyo models are certainly within striking distance at these discounted prices. He's always owned dead receivers and wouldn't want to give up any quality just for 5.2.4 or 7.2.4 capability. What do we think? 
Uh, I mean, these are. I mean, that are the RZ series. Yeah, are good receivers. They're it's just very that, good receivers, and I mean, it's, they they do analog to HDMI conversion, although with an odd caveat that they will only do it at 480i input resolution even on their component video input it'll only do the analog to hdmi conversion at 480i but these are old video game systems i don't foresee that being an issue they're gonna be 480i anyways yeah uh Uh, Uh, i mean yeah that's fine i mean it seems like if you're gonna do atmos i want you to have the ability to use four speakers i honestly do yeah (laughs) excuse me uh it doesn't seem like you're really worried about sound quality all that much and you're not certainly you certainly haven't mentioned the words room correction on any well i mean that was no that was uh, initially he was like should i actually forego what i want to do with all the hdmi stuff just to get multi-q xt instead of regular multi-q so he definitely can cares about yeah that that but i mean the functionality you're talking about as far as the video conversion and everything else if it's contained in all the channels that you want and the amplifi- amplification yeah. channels that you're interested in are all contained within one receiver and the room correction isn't there i mean, I mean me, the thing the is, these the are accu eq advance which at least does multiple microphone measurement positions instead of the original accu eq which was a single measurement position right. and essentially useless this is the advanced version now you get to take multiple uh microphone measurements it's it's not too bad, you know. I I still prefer Odyssey mainly. I got to stress this mainly because of um, dynamic EQ, which is not a feature that you will have on the Onkyos. The THX certified ones have the THX listing mode with uh, THX loudness plus, but you're talking about Atmos and there is no THX listening mode for Atmos. So you right, wouldn't right. have an equivalent to dynamic EQ. If anything is making giving me pause, it's that. But these are such a value. I mean, if you went for that RZ630, which powers nine speakers on its own, can't expand any further, but it powers nine speakers on its own, $350? <laughs> And like yeah. the fact that it doesn't have THX, like I don't care about that at all. Yeah. And actually having the zone two HDMI output might be helpful for you since you're running both a flat panel and a projector. Sometimes that ends up being a helpful feature. So I'm like 350 bucks for that RZ630. Um, should he worry about being able to expand a 7.2.4 in the future instead of 5.2.4? I'm not super worried about that. I mean, I don't think it's, so. That, get the yeah, RZ630. I don't, I don't, I don't even remember what this room looks like, so yeah. <laughs> Johnny. Johnny has two different setups, a dedicated theater in the living room. He uses Kef Q-series speakers in both the Q500 towers in his theater, the Q100 bookshelf speakers in the living room. But he only has one Q200C center speaker, and now he's like to get a second center speaker. All of his Kef Q speakers uh, are the older version. He likes that his towers, bookshelves, and center all use the exact same drivers, five and a quarter mid-range with a concentric tweeter and five uh, and a five and a quarter inch woofers. The new Q650C uses drivers that look a little different, and they're all larger at six and a half uh, uh, inches and cost 650, which is more than he'd like to spend. Mm. He looked for another Q200C, but he can't find anywhere. Uh, he can't find one for sale anywhere, except for less has the larger Q600C for 450. So would the Q600C be his best possible match, even though it uses a larger 6.5-inch driver? Is there a less expensive alternative that he that we could recommend? And if he buys a Q600C, uh, should he use it with his Q500 towers in his theater or go with the Q100 bookshelves in his living room? And the other set up will use the, the Q200C in either case. Uh, I mean, I'm not super worried about Kef's timbre matching each other i feel like that's that's a kind like of across a the same q series yeah i'm not I, worried about that at all I, I would go for the one that that in, in the, in the your last question is try it <laughs> i suppose although i mean you've got both of them i would put the bigger one in the theater but that's yeah, just with me. the towers i mean just just as yeah. far as output capability goes the towers yeah. have more output capability than the q100s which were the smallest bookshelf model right. so i put the smaller center with the smaller bookshelf speakers yeah. and the bigger q600 c with the bigger q500 towers that for timbre matching i mean me. i'm not worried about that at i would i, I would 100 i'd go snap with up that q600 before it's yeah. gone yeah i mean i don't have a suggestion that's cheaper because kef matches darn nice with kef and right. i i i wouldn't particularly want to point you to something else when you do at least have an option that is the exact same series right uh, i mean yeah. you, you i mean it'd be pretty easy to to look at like a really neutral speaker and say that 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 would probably be safe 
right. like a, an RBH or something like yeah. that. But when you have access to a fairly inexpensive Kef speaker, just get the Kef. Of the exact same series, yep. Yeah, yeah. The, the worry about the six and a half inch bass drivers instead of five and a quarter, not a yeah. concern at all. That does not bother me. David. David's pretty sure his forever speaker's search has concluded. He's going with the Kef R series, and now it's time to fill out the rest of his speaker series. Congratulations, System. by the way, because that's awesome. That's a good speaker. Yeah. Should he get the R200C or the larger R600C as a center to go along with his R300 bookshelf front left right speakers? Do we know anything about his room and or do we care? I mean, he's got the R200s. I mean, I mean it, what's, the, what's the difference between the 600 and the 300 here? Uh, well, okay. So the R200C center... This is in the R series, not the Q series. Very similar to the last question, but different series. The R200 uses oh, the sorry. five and a quarter inch mid-range uh. and woofers. The 600 uses the six and a half inch size. The R300 bookshelf speaker does use a six and a half inch woofer, but one of them, and therefore, if you look at the specs, the power handling and maximum output capabilities of the R200C almost perfectly match the power handling and output capabilities of the R300 bookshelf speakers. Okay. So I'm like, there's your match because they all take equal power and play equally loud. Yes, the woofer diameter is slightly different sizes, but that that really doesn't matter. Uh, so I'd go with the R200C. All right, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> he found someone selling the Kef E305 5.1 speaker package for a very low price. He was thinking he would use four of the included E301 wall-mountable speakers as his surrounds and surround backs. Good idea or bad idea? I don't know what the E300, 305s are. The so. E3, yeah, so it's the E301 satellites, which are those one that kind of look like an egg and have the integrated wall mount that can swivel. Uh, I mean, oh, I love them. Yeah. I love yeah, them yeah. as an alternative to the Focal Birds. Uh, so yeah. unfortunately, the Focal Birds and the E301s are both discontinued now. So I'm starting to run out of options for that style of speaker. But I I love the 301s as surrounded surround packs. I think that's that's great choice. Yeah be fine yeah very. he's using the denon x 4300 h he's already installed four rbh in ceiling speakers with backer boxes so he's going to have a 7.2.4 configuration with his dual svs pc12 and sd subs handling the subwoofer duties uh the x 4300 has nine amplifier channels built in so he's going to need to install at least two amplifier two external and uh Two channel amp, external amp. Regardless, he was thinking Emotiva Bass A three three hundred, but the Outlaw Model five thousand offers five, five channels of similar wattage for not a whole lot more money. What do we think? We think that you have gone down the rabbit hole that Tom went down <laughs> when he started it's this an little project. Easy one to do. Yeah. A so I got the Parts Express or whatever that thing is. A Dayton. You got the Dayton. Yeah. 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 Just a two-channel amp, which has like 60 watts or some crap like that. And I used it for my, because of the, and I don't know if your 4300 is the same way as my 4. It is, yeah. Two, you could 200. either, so yeah, yeah, you have to say which of your two out of your 11 speakers has to be powered externally. And your choices are the front left and right or uh, the rear most at most speakers, whether those are like top rears or in Tom's case, top middles, or maybe right. it's rear heights, but the, the rear most at most speakers are the other choice. So you're saying two of these 11 speakers have to be powered externally, but you're only allowed to say that those are either the front left, right, or the rear most at most speakers. So the, the, the so what you've done is you, you probably started there and you thought, well, for just a little bit more money, I can get this other amp this this nah. uh the emotiva and this is exactly the road i went down yep. emotiva bass x whatever this the a300, a300 which is a stereo amplifier so it's still only powering two of those channels but he's probably thinking if he gets the, the a300 right. he power the front left and right yeah yeah uh, but then he's like, well, wait a second. If I'm going to get that, then just for a little bit more money, I can go over to Outlaw. Now, just so you know what your next step is, you're going to go to Monoprice and look at the Monolith For a Monolith, series. yes. Because that's what I did. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my. For only 1000 Now, remember, we started off at 100 bucks here. Uh -huh. Only $1,000 or $1,200, I can get three channels. But if I only get three channels for 1500 bucks, I can get five. And for uh -huh. five, yeah. yeah. So my recommendation is to get the Dayton, whatever the heck it is, two-channel <laughs> amp and have it power your top the middles APA and top The APA-102. Yes. That's my recommendation. I, I know I can, where you're going. I can dig that. That makes sense. Now, uh, the, oh, my only caveat here is if uh, – because the R-series the R from KEF, they're not – it's 
typically super hard to drive speaker, but I don't know exactly your configuration. So if you're sitting very, very far away or you're, mm. you've got something else, some other... Okay, there's a helicopter. That's weird. Uh, some other thing that's going on in your room that might explain why you need, in quotes, to have... Uh, external power for your kef speakers up front mm -hmm. and you can make a case that convinced me i i come at me bro but uh i think that you probably only need two very weak ch channels to power your top middle your top, top rears, rears yeah yeah i can dig that uh i will also say i'm willing to go down the rabbit hole some ways and i would say all right you know what instead of 400 dollars for an a300 stereo amplifier I pay $100 more, I pay $500 for the A500. Now you're going to go, but wait, the watts per channel, all channels driven, went down Who by cares? some wattage. Really doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That I, wouldn't, I, I would be willing to get the five channel amp because I'm like, if I'm going to power my front, left, right, externally, I kind of want to power my center with the same thing. I mean... We know you don't have to, but I am I can be just as crazy and silly as other audiophile people. And I'm like, yeah, let, 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 I mean, it's $100 more you get the five-channel amp. You can do yeah, something with the other but you guys are up at 500 bucks, and I'm at 100 yeah, that is true. <laughs> okay. But I'm stopping I'm before I get to the... 20% your price. Tom, I'm stopping before I get to the monolith. you got to be proud of that. I got to the monolith and went, what have I done? Yes. And I went straight back. I, I went straight back like a like a drug addict shaking off his his, his last high. I and just went and ordered that that Dayton Audio APA 10 whatever. And it I has got. worked and just fine. It's been great. So this Kef R300 speakers come with two different sets of uh, optional port plugs, so you can have the port open, partially plugged, or fully plugged. Is it worth the time and effort to experiment with all three of these options? Since no matter what we say to you, you're gonna. <laughs> it is totally worth it to experiment oh. with all these options. I would it, say, how far away are the backs of your R300 yeah. speakers from the wall? If if they're in a bookshelf, like in a bookcase with a, a cubby behind them, plug yeah. the port. Yeah. Done and done. You don't have to experiment. Just plug the port if that's the situation. If you have them close to a wall, uh, now you may be experiment. But if you've got 18 inches or more from the back of the speaker to the wall, then just leave the port open and don't bother experimenting. That's my take. Okay. So when he was doing his A-B uh, comparisons of the Kef R300 and the Ascend Sierra 2 speakers, he made sure they were level match so he wouldn't just favor the latter ones. And while he wound up preferring the Kefs overall, the one thing he did he liked better about the Sierra 2s was that they almost always sounded a bit more detailed and clearer with female vocals. Uh, that old, as though the veil had been lifted type of difference. <laughs> but then when while listening to a song he really likes, he cranked up the volume on his Kefs and all that detail and clarity was suddenly there. So the Sierra 2s managed to deliver all that. Oh, he's making the amplifier. He's, 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 he's trying to convince us of his amplifier. So the Sierra 2 managed to see, I saw it. I'm going to come to deliver all that detail and clarity at, at a lower volume. But the Kefs could do it. They just need to be louder. What accounts for that difference? And is there any way to retain... All of that detail and clarity with his caps, but a lower volume level with a higher wattage amplifier help on that point. <laughs> on that front, even with the playback volumes at its lowest level. Uh, I know. I mean, this idea that those that having the that, that having somehow the headroom. They, yeah. Well, the the real the real case that they're making is that somehow the amplifier is not able to give every little bit it needs in order right. to give you that clarity and and but he managed to do this with the receiver he already has didn't yeah. change the amplifiers it was just changing the volume knob on yeah, his existing yeah. receiver but he's like can i play the kefs at the lower volume because maybe i don't want to crank everything all the time right, right, right. no i uh, hear you yeah i hear you I mean, that, uh, is, that is one of these differences between the speakers because even if a speaker is capable of that detail, it mostly comes down to the ratio of direct to reflected sound that reaches your ear and yeah. what you might consider the total power output, which is like the, if you looked at a whole sphere of where the, the sound power goes, that can be different from speaker to speaker. And I yeah. mean, it is, that's part of a speaker design. So something like a ribbon tweeter is quite good at delivering a higher ratio of direct sound to your ear than reflected sound. In the case of the Rowell Ribbon tweeters, primarily in the vertical direction, but that's still, if you consider total sound power, a very significant thing. The Kefs have this very even distribution of power in every direction, up, down, left, and right. right. And as a result, the ratio of direct to reflected sound, you have a little bit more reflected sound because it's also coming from ceiling and floor bounce and stuff like that, whereas the RAL tends to curtail that. That 
mostly explains the difference. So it's not that the Cavs aren't playing that detail. It's just when you turn the volume up, you're now getting a higher ratio of direct sound versus reflected sound reaching right. your ears. And that largely explains it. And an amplifier has nothing to do with any of it. Right. And, you know, one of the reasons you might have preferred the Cavs over uh, the Sierras it is very well could be because of this dispersion. Yes. You know, it, it cross seats, you're now you're, you're able to really get the same or similar experience you know, you're not having as much, quite as much beaming or, you know, the this uh, uh, more directed sound that you maybe sounded great in one seat, but not so good in right. another, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, these are trade offs that the designers make when it comes to making speakers. They're like, if I go with this tweeter, what does that mean for my design and how am I going to compensate for its its deficiencies? Because there's no tweeter that's perfect. You know, everyone's got its its issues in, on some level in some place. So, you know, this, this is one of the things that, you know, you have to decide for yourself. And that's why speakers can still be subjective, whereas amplifiers cannot. So <laughs> let's just, <laughs> just to let us know, along with his Kef R series and RBH speakers, Denon X4300H and SVS PC12 NSDs, he's got Santa speaker stands, 130 inch elite screens projection screen, BenQ HT 2050 projector, APC power projection, mono price cables, a Harmony companion remote, and HTC. HTPC running J River and HT Market Home Theater recliners. So I guess the AV Rant special is that what you got? Yep. Did you go? Did the you go to AV Row? <laughs> that is a that is a, a, the greatest hits of everything that comes out of Rob's mouth on the regular. <laughs> So he bought many items refurbished, which saved him a lot of money. And all in all, he spent just over nine grand for a system that's getting darn close to what he had dreamed about over ten years ago. Avery's influence is obvious throughout the product list, so he wants to say thanks for the help. And he'll be back when he's ready to upgrade his projector to a 4K HDR model. Well, thank you. That is great, and congratulations. And main thing is, you're happy, and that's awesome. That's right. Sushmet on Twitter. By coincidence, Sushmet also wrote to uh, us about what an improvement he heard when he increased his volume setting from negative 25. Uh, to negative 15 instead. He has a Yamaha receiver with a Send Sierra 2 front and Focal Bird surrounds with a two, uh, PC200, two, I'm sorry, PC2000 sub. He always thought it was a great sound system. By simply turning up the volume, it blew him away and made him prefer what he's got at home over his local IMAX theater, which, by the way, is probably at least 10 dB louder than what you have ever oh, played at home. At they least. are full reference volume. So take that minus 15, turn it up another 15 to zero, and you're oh, starting my. to get to IMAX volume. I was going to say, and they probably goose it in those places well, too because I've been in there and it's been absolutely unbearable. Plus they're loud. playing cinema reference level and a lot of home releases have been remastered to be quieter than that. So yeah, yeah. maybe turn it yeah. yours up to plus 10 and now you're at full IMAX yeah. volume. So he'll turn up the volume whenever he possibly can now, but for those times when he can't, is there anything to do to keep all the detail and excitement? We'll find... Uh, well, finally completing his base traps and absorption panels help in any way. Well, they should help because reflected sound is part of the things that base traps. You are and reducing panels. that ratio of, uh, or increasing the ratio of direct to reflected sound by having the absorption panels. So that, yeah. as far as getting clarity and detail, that that is kind of why we put the absorption panels up. Right. Yeah. And then make sure when you do so that you rerun whatever Y pow you yes. have on your Yamaha receiver because that that will change everything. Yeah. As the well, other so. thing is I, I'm not sure if he maybe has a little bit older Yamaha model or if it's a modern right. one, but do activate if you have it Y pow volume because right. that is their equivalent to Odyssey Dynamic EQ, which is the thing that says, okay, I've turned the master volume to below re reference volume. And in either case, minus 25 or minus 15, you're below full reference volume. That means some sounds, particularly deep bass sounds, but also some things that are you know, spatially, stuff that's behind us, above us, our ear isn't as good at hearing it. And when you turn the volume down, we lose more of that detail faster than the mid-range frequencies in front of us that we're very good at hearing. So YPAL volume uses those curves curves of equal loudness to attempt to keep all the details audible. You're not actually lowering anything below the threshold at which you can hear it altogether. So do activate YPAL volume if you have it. Um, that will help. The acoustic panels will help. And uh, yeah, that's about as good as you can do, though. There's not right. much you can do beyond that. Shane. Shane has been trying to wrap his head around the difference between delay setting for the subs in the AV receiver, the phase knob on the back of some subs, and the polarity, sometimes called phase, switch on the back of a lot of other subs. He gets that the polarity 10-180 degree switch would simply have the subwoofer driver pull uh, when it's, the signal says to push, and to push when the signal says to pull. It's the exact reversal of the wave uh, signal being sent. 
correct? Yep, that's exactly that's, it. That's exactly what it is. Yep. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, this wave's like 20 feet long. <laughs> it just it doesn't matter if it started if it started with the up or the down. <laughs> you know, it just Oh no, it has to go it has to do a full cycle twice before our brain's ever going to register yeah. it anyway, so yeah. So he says it doesn't matter what frequency or group of frequencies are playing, it's the exact same wave just flipped. So let's say you have two subwoofers, one's polarity switches at zero, the other is at eight one eighty when the one sub is pushing the uh pushing its driver out, sub two is pulling the driver in and vice versa, correct? That seems simple enough. That is yes, exactly what right. the polarity switch does. Yes. So what about the delay setting in the receiver? Again, if you have two subs, but you give them each a different delay setting, the movement of the drivers will, uh, will be out of sync, right? And since you've just you've just delayed the entire signal by a certain number of milliseconds, one particular frequency might be exactly 180, 180 degrees of the phase, but so all the other frequencies wouldn't be right. So a delay and polarity, uh, so delay and polarity don't do the same thing except for one specific frequency and its harmonics. Is that correct? Well, I mean, there's I don't think there's any way to delay a sub so that you would you would be the same as a 180 because no no I that, mean, that, at, no. At, at one specific frequency you could do it yes. i guess yes whatever whatever that whatever that one that was the number of feet difference with yes. i guess 24 would be the, the longest you could do because you play you place one plus 24 delay and the other one minus i mean a plus 12 delay and the other one minus 12 delay that's oh, a no, usually the delay setting you can set quite a few milliseconds in there uh, uh yeah because that's not it's not the same as the decibel range so usually you can do quite a bit of delay setting in milliseconds but no i mean it literally just is okay the signal is being sent to subwoofer now and then a certain number of milliseconds later that signal gets sent to subwoofer two and so they are delayed in their beginning to play that signal by whatever the delay difference is. I mean, that is exactly what's happening. So yes, they are not synchronized in their movement, right. right? One begins to move, and then a number of milliseconds later, the other one begins to move. They move in the exact same way, but one of them a little bit after the other. That's right, and we want them both to be moving at the exact, well, if they're properly placed in a rectangular room, we want them to be moving at the exact same time. Yeah. In and out. But yeah. as, only as up. across the room from each other in a rectangular room is that the case. Right. Yeah. So what about the phase knob that some subwoofers have? Is that exactly the same thing as adding a delay, or is it a bit different? Can you shift the phase without adding a delay? What would be the uh, what would the end result be any different? So they are not the exact same thing. All right. Uh, so we think you, you described the polarity switch perfectly, right? The signal says push out and it actually pulls in the signal says pull in and it actually pushes out that's the polarity switch and we know the delay is just the signal gets there it just starts playing a little bit later right the phase switch uh it begins to play right away all right it's not a delay it isn't the subwoofer adding a delay to the signal the way the av receiver is it's just that everything uh, imagine that instead of the driver of the subwoofer beginning at its neutral position it's beginning a little bit pushed out or a little bit pulled in and that's sort of where it's starting its journey. It isn't physically doing that, but you can think of it that way. Right. And now it still follows the same wave pattern, but as though the driver had been offset to begin with. So it doesn't push, like if, it, if the signal begins by saying, okay, push out and then pull back in. Well, it doesn't push out quite as far and then it pulls in a little bit farther and then goes back out. So it, it ends up drawing the same wave as a delay would have been. If you take the delay wave and then you know, move it back on the graph, right. they end up overlining, <clears throat> they end up overlapping perfectly. So the second question, uh, you know, is the end result any different? Well, not really, because again, we have to have two cycles of any given frequency right. for our brain to even register it. If we only had a single cycle of a given frequency, they would be a little bit different, right? One of them would be an actual delay in time. The other one would just be as though the driver had begun offset in its starting position. But because we have to have at least two cycles of anything for us to hear it, you end up with the same wave overlaps, whether you have changed this phase or whether you have changed the delay. So that's why right. we say it's okay if you don't have a fully variable phase knob to, to use delay. to use something like a mini DSP, which doesn't have a phase difference, but it has a delay difference because the end result does end up being the same. So the idea of doing this with the phase knob is essentially since we're offsetting those waves, mm -hmm. you know, the problem is, is at your seat or at, you know, let's just say at your seat, you know, there's cancellations 
and then there's additive waves as they come in sometimes they add sometimes they subtract from each other if that if you're having serious problems with dips and humps at your main seat well then you gotta move the phase, one of them waves right it's like it's like tuning in uh you know, like if you ever, you know, tune in a radio, basically, you're just kind of like moving that, that needle uh, yeah. a little bit. You're moving that waveform a little bit until it stops canceling as much and stops adding as much at your seat. The problem is it's, it's just about impossible for us with current technology for us to predict <laughs> what's the perfect phase at for your sub to be at, at, you know, your seat. So uh, the way we do that is make sure we, pl- we properly place them and then the magic of physics makes it happen. <laughs> his receiver offers delays. His mini DSP offers delays in polarity, and his subwoofers have fully variable phase knob. Is there a recommended approach as to which adjustments to use first, second, third? It seems like a lot of places to adjust the signal, so just make a difference, a significant difference which one he uses or in which order. The answer to that is the only difference it really, the only time it really, really make a difference is if you're applying room correction yeah. after it. Yeah. Okay. So if you're making adjustments before, then it, then in, 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 then if you then apply it so say you do it at your receiver mm-hmm. and then you run odyssey and then you do it again at your mini dsp and then you run the dsp you know having whatever you run the the uh, the the room correction is where is where it makes a difference uh but the reality is is that hopefully you don't have to play with this at all you should just properly set up your subs and then the phase <laughs> knobs should should be at zero or zero, you know, zero. The delay should only be whatever the receiver sets it as, and the uh, um, the phase switch. Outside should be of a at rectangular zero. room, that that's rare that you get that lucky. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll explain this almost in reverse. What I want to happen at the end of this process is I run my auto setup, you know, Odyssey, Wipeout, whatever it is, and I actually, as much as we like sometimes laud uh, sub EQHT, right, for trying to automate some of this. If you have the adjustment abilities of a mini DSP and independent, uh, you know, fully variable phase knobs on your subs, I want a mono signal coming out of my receiver for the subwoofer output because I'm fine with the auto setup sending a single delay for the overall subwoofer channel because that's just phase aligning the bass with the rest of my speakers and that I do want to do. But I don't want my... AV receivers auto setup program to be giving independent delays to, to my two subs if I'm already independently adjusting them with something else. So that's the end result. I'll run the auto setup, but I only want a mono subwoofer signal coming out of it. Now you have a mini DSP and you have fully variable phase knobs. Well, the mini DSP is capable of more than what's just built into your subwoofer. So I would probably yeah. leave the subwoofer settings alone. I right? just set everything to zero. The crossover knob set as high as it could possibly go. Go to bypass. The phase knob set to zero. Uh, I mean, the volume knobs you'll want to uh, adjust so that it's level matched. But then I would use the mini DSP to get my base uniformity and then i would have my av receiver send a mono signal to the subs Mm. yes that's my order i agree (laughs) damien after damien showed us his room eq wizard uh measurements of his base response we commented that just a couple of bands of eq right around 30 and 55 hertz could get this frequency response looking pretty damn close to linear at uh, at least at the position where he took his room EQ wizard measurements. Yeah. So we looked at it and we went, look, I mean, this is pretty good. We knocked down that hump. We down, knocked down that hump. And you're good to go. You're about done. That's right. So Damien thought he'd try using the manual EQ built in this Onkyo 646 receiver. Each channel gets a five-band manual EQ that allows for plus or minus 6 dB of adjustment. So you can uh, select for some predefined frequencies. He made the changes to the subwoofer channel and he took a new room EQ wizards, but nothing appeared to have changed. <laughs> hmm. So he decided to try running uh, Accu EQ to see what EQ settings it would apply automatically. But first, it wanted to set a subwoofer output trim level to plus 10 dB. Damien had already level matched his two subwoofers using Room EQ Wizard, but since he wanted to get his AccuQ working, he turned the volume dials on his uh, subs until the AccuQ has subwoofer output trim level set to zero. At the end of the process, everything he played sounded louder all the time. The 646 receiver does not show relative volume on the front panel, just a range from zero to 80, so isn't sure what value perfectly corresponds to the reference volume but everyone in this family just naturally set the volume to five or six digits below lower than before so why did everything get louder after running accu eq because when you were running room eq wizard through your receiver 
you did not have it set to reference volume. And Very likely. Yeah. That's the most likely thing. I mean, so uh, there's a few things. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Ankyu does the thing where it doesn't matter where your master, master volume is set before you run Accu EQ. For the sake of completeness, I would set... Uh, so, first of all, I, I looked through the manual. I didn't have a ton of time to look through it, so I looked through it briefly, and I couldn't find where it said what value in, between 0 and 80 should correspond you, to full reference volume. You can volume. find that. It's you in there. Definitely there, some, find there were there. three yes. pages of the tiniest print I've ever seen in a manual. I mean, it's fine. I'm reading on a computer. I can blow it up, but I didn't have time to look through it all, but I'm sure it's in there somewhere. But yeah, it's usually there. it's 12 decibels below the maximum. That's typically where it is. And so, usually you can go into the, re the receiver settings and change that. But that, I looked, six. and there doesn't seem to be that option on this model. Which and I have, I've dealt with Onkyo <laughs> models that did this, excuse me, the same thing. And yeah. yes, I just Googled it, and it was like, yeah. you know, volume level 12 or 78 or something like yeah. that was the it's highest. probably going to be 68 reference. or maybe 72, yeah. but probably 68 yeah. in this case since 80 is the maximum. Uh, but regardless, so, yeah. um, it would be behoove you to find out what, corresponds to actual four rest volume set your master volume dial there before you run accu eq because i've come across ones where you have to do that or else accu eq isn't necessary i'm not specifically but the auto setup isn't accurate unless you do set the master volume beforehand but more likely it's what tom said it's that uh room eq wizard is not a an absolute thing you actually need to calibrate if you want to take sound pressure level measurements that are accurate you need to calibrate the whole system with an independent sound pressure level meter to make sure that what the microphone is reading is registering in your computer which is then feeding into your av receiver which needs to be set at full reference volume so right. there's again multiple regardless things. full reference volume has to be yep step need one that. on your need that on, on your, your master receiver. dial but yeah. that that could easily explain why this happened yeah, and then especially if it's going through your computer, or what your computer's putting out, you know, there could be a volume interference there too. So there's yeah. all sorts of things. So why did uh, Accu EQ set his subwoofer output trim levels to plus 10 dB initially? When he level matches subs using his UMAC uh, one and Room EQ Wizard, those had him turn the subs down. His Accu EQ has had him turn the subs back up, which is correct. I'm gonna go with the Accu EQ. <laughs> If, to be honest with I mean, you. I, again, if the master yeah. volume is that, I, I don't even know if that's necessary. It shouldn't be, but I would yeah. do it just to be sure. If you do have the master volume be. set to master volume, uh, to set to reference volume, and then you run AccuEQ and it says, okay, here's how loud you turn, need to turn up the volume dials on your subs, that, that should be correct. Yeah. yeah. So do you have to run AccuEQ before you're able to use the manual EQ adjustments for each speaker channel in the 646? He asks because he tried to use the manual EQ before he ever ran AccuEQ, but when he measured with Room EQ Wizard, there was no change. Uh, so I'm a little confused by this. So he... He he, he tried to use the manual EQ setting. He hadn't run AccuEQ at all. He tried yeah. to use the manual EQ setting. But then he it, measured, and it, it didn't show any difference. Didn't seem to have made it made any difference when he measured. So then he's like, "Well, okay, I'll try running Accu." He's like, "Did I have to run Accu EQ before the manual equalizer settings I would will think take so, effect?" To be honest with you, I don't. I, know. I couldn't find any mention of that specifically in the manual. That but would again, be I my guess. I didn't read every word. Uh, yeah. I did see though that any manual EQ settings that you ha that you make, you do have to save to a preset, and then you have to activate that preset with every listening mode and input change. <laughs> so nice. maybe you just changed inputs and didn't repress the preset right. to which you had saved your manual equalizer settings, because that's an easy step to forget, and it's not like sound isn't going to play. So that could have been it. <laughs> All right. This is also Damien, but this is something new. Yeah. All that subwoofer stuff was uh, was in his old house. Now he's bought a new house. So what? We're not telling you to live in this house. Well, because anymore. he's we're still going to be going questions. through subwoofer setup in the new house, and it, it's, oh, it's useful for other people too. It has a basement with a room that's going to be used as a theater, but they also have a family room, an open concept upstairs, where they like to be able to watch TV and listen to music. The photos he sent show the previous owner's furniture, but Damien's couch is quite similar, and the layout shown is quite close to what Damien will have in his family room too. All right, so down. Which one's downstairs? Uh, uh, one of the, the right downstairs, downstairs is later on. We're just focusing on the upstairs family room at the moment. These right, two photos. So That's upstairs. Th there's another upstairs above his upstairs. 
Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's a two floor above the basement. So he's got a basement. Oh, and okay. He's got a basement below this. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, 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 okay. So hardwood floors, high ceilings, fireplace on the left, open at the back, including the second floor. Since the uh, since the family room setup is for casual viewing and listening, he's considering a 3.0 or 3.1 setup. Since he figures installing a full surround sound system would be a challenge. He already owns a Pioneer Andrew Jones uh, five-speaker plus... Uh, set plus a dual SB212 and SD subwoofers. So should you use what he has in the family room and buy a whole new speaker set up for his theater room in his basement? Or should you use existing speakers and sub in his basement and buy a new sound system for his living room? The max budget will be $1,500 in the case. I don't know. What does the basement look like? Can you tell us what this basement <laughs> that, well, looks like? Well, that does like? come down. I mean, there are the photos below. Uh, for reasons coming up later, I actually think you might kind of need to get new speakers for the basement. Okay. Um, almost nothing to do with sound quality, purely logistics and placement concerns. Uh, so, I mean, the Pioneer Andrew Jones towers in this upstairs room for casual viewing, for television viewing, they're going to work fantastic. And as long as you're okay with them looks-wise, yeah. I'd have no problem using them there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, well, that basically answers that question because he asks about right. subwoofers separately. Yeah. So, if he, uh, if, you know, okay, we can skip that one because you said don't do it. Uh, could he do three? I don't. Okay, so it's, could he do three point oh so that he doesn't need a subwoofer in the family room? Would that uh, would that be advisable, dude? I'd be honest with you. I'd go with two point zero. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is I casual. was all, I was all ready to say to get uh, not to use the SB twelve NSDs in this family room because that yeah. isn't really an appropriate choice. I'm like, I want. I st I still want a sub up here. I get I mean, a cylinder. I, I get a PC two thousand. Oh, well, geez, that's so overkill. That's not for this size room. That's not well, overkill. I, I, it is overkill. It's overkill because it's a casual listening environment. I know, it, but where... you still want the base. I know. And look yeah, at all that base is going. All this open space. I you know, and that's why you don't capable. want it. I mean, if, if it's going to be super casual, I mean, just throw the couple speakers up there and it's never advisable let it go. to not have a subwoofer. Never. That is not true. <laughs> never. That is not true. I, I I gave my parents a subwoofer that sits in, that sits there, and they keep turning it off every time I go over there. Like I was making noise. Like that's what it's supposed to do. No way to. But live. It was louder than other things. I'm like, I'm very good with using the Pioneer speakers here. I would have you get a sub. I'd go with a cylinder because it's easy to place and hide and put a wrap around it, make it look pretty. Uh, I go with a PC2000. Tom seems to be okay with no sub. I. I would try it with no sub and just mm. see see if you felt really felt like you needed it. That's what I would do, and I would go two point oh. But I, uh, I would two, keep two point. I would keep I think, the uh, the SB twelve NSDs for your basement. I think those will be fine. I don't know the size of your basement yet because I haven't read that far. But uh, yeah, the SB twelves are quite a very good sub. So yeah. I would I would not waste them up here. Uh, any suggestions to keep uh, to keep in mind? Uh, getting decent sound in this family room well there's if it decent, echoes uh, i mean it's hardwood <laughs> floors it's flat walls in here it looks like it very well might echo right now yeah i don't uh i don't know that you're gonna get decent sound <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that that should be the goal i think the goal should be can i hear it can i understand it mm -hmm. and 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 all that and that and that's honestly kind of why i'm leaning away from a sub or leaning away from even the center channel i don't really think any of that's necessary because what you really just need is volume <laughs> and fewer sources of sound you know what i mean fewer things to create waves interact with other waves <laughs> yeah just yeah. 2.0 let that. it go i mean this is we've had similar looking rooms in the past there when lee was here we had a couple of rooms like this you know the high vaulted ceiling yeah. open at the back the sort of half ceiling at the back there over the kitchen and dining room that leads to the second floor upstairs is so we've seen similar things and same advice there i mean if you can you get absorption anywhere in this room that you can including like you cover a whole wall in cotton batting and then cover all of that in fabric <coughs> and it still yeah. looks like one solid colored wall but it, now it's cotton batting with fabric over it and it acts as absorption so you know anywhere that you're going to have artwork you make that a printed panel because i i wouldn't be surprised at all if it literally echoes in this room right now yeah so let's go on to the basement. He doesn't have exact dimensions for the basement theater room, but it's long, it's a bit narrow, and again, the pictures he sent shows previous owners' furniture, not Damien's. His wife would like to have a lot of seating. Their siblings, their nieces, and nephews come over to visit quite often, so his wife wants everybody to be able to sit in the theater together. They've got two three-seater couches, a love seat with cup holders, and, poss and possibly some bar stools and low cuddle seats, almost like beanbag chairs. So... 
I don't know, dude. I can't. I can't. I can't. Yeah. So we're that. looking at so there's armware at the front with a TV over to the right. These are the the existing owners, uh, you know, the previous owners set up. So this isn't Damien set up, but that's going to be like the front of the room because the opposite to that, there's a wall uh, or a door on what will be the back wall that leads to the utility room. Well, actually, that whole description is coming up there, isn't yeah, there? Yeah. 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 The back of the room, there's a door that leads to the furnace and the hot water heater. On the right wall, there are doors to the storage room plus the electrical panel and the rest of the basement. Windows on the left and the door that leads outside uh, up front on the left wall. Damon's oldest son has his bedroom in the basement, so he'll be using that door to come in and out of the house. Oh, that sounds great. It's like a basement suite for him. <laughs> I understand. But he's that. coming through the theater every time. Oh, good. Wipe your feet. So Damien is trying to figure out how to position and dis uh, his display and front speaker so that the door can swing open without hitting a speaker. What do we recommend for his display and front speaker placement? Holy crap, dude. Yeah, so this is this why is I was like, I don't know if I want those Pioneer Towers because that's right where the door is going to go <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I guess you could have them closer together with a smaller screen <sighs> or you could go, what, a drop-down acoustically transparent projection screen? And then have the speakers all behind. Okay, so that. there's an armoire on yes. this one on the what is going to be the front wall. Well, I don't know that that should be the front wall. I think he mm. should go with the wall that is the um, the picture on it. Okay. And the reason I say that is it's it, it, now that's on the wide wall. Yeah, so you'd okay. you'd be going for wide seating, certainly not multiple row front to back seating. Yes, I and I I, I mean. I, I don't see a way that you can make this so that this door doesn't hit things. <laughs> I mean, I mean I, I, all I was thinking is that you could do in wall speakers or very thin on wall front speakers, yeah. like the ones that uh, CAF or RBH sells. They have very thin on wall speakers. You put a door stop on the door so that it doesn't literally crash in it, or you go in wall. You could do in wall speakers. Um, right. You know, and then the door can go ahead and swing open. Now, obviously, if the door is staying open, that's a problem. But I don't see that as that's being an outside thing. door. It's an outside door. It looks open? like it yeah. even has an automatic door closer on it. So I think that oh, door I is closing. You know, uh, so that that could be the solution there. I don't see the towers as being a particularly good option no. if that ends up being your front wall. But yeah, if you do the sideways. Uh, arrangement as Tom is suggesting well I mean the only thing I'm thinking of is when it comes to wanting to have a bunch of seats I mean you can have some wide seating but it's still not going to be a ton of seats there's going to be a bunch of people well I don't know how floor. wide this thing is too but there's going to be there could be like you know you could be stacking these couches sort of in like a half circle mm. and have a big a big screen that mm. you're basically projecting on now I like Rob's idea which is a it, this is going to be difficult, honestly, but having a drop-down screen that's going to be awfully close to that front wall, I mean, it's going to be dropping right down in front. Because this, you got to remember, the, the drop-down screens have a, a case that they yes. are in, and this door opens up smack dab on the ceiling. I mean, there is no clearance. So that right. means that it has to be, you have to be able to get a case that fits so that this door can open without hitting that case. Right. And I mean, it could be one of those problematic. one of those motorized screens that actually recesses into the ceiling. That would solve. But that. he's got a drop tile ceiling. He so, does have a drop tile ceiling, and I mean, you that, never want to open that door when the screen is down. Right. If the if the screen actually is going to be wide enough to be behind the door. So your yeah. other option is in walls, and then a. Uh, acoustically tra transparent screen that is mounted to the yeah. wall. Which and, I kind of like in here. I like that idea. I think if you're going to go on that wall, that's that's literally all. That is the only option, and that's in, <laughs> in walls with a drop with a with a acoustically flush transparent screen. screen. Yeah, yeah. And then you can just stack your couches on. But you know, honestly, dude, I think the wide seating is going to be a lot more doable. This is not a particularly high basement. You don't have high ceilings in here, and. Those couches, if you try to build risers for each one of them oh, yeah, so no, that I, people can I see, was actually you're going to be on the ceiling in very little time. I was actually thinking instead of doing multiple rows of seats, I was like, you take the two long couches and you put them on either side. Granted, there's not a whole lot of space between them in the middle because this isn't a very wide room. Yeah. But you put them on the side, so they're fa they're facing each other, they're facing sideways, but people can line up and they can turn their heads a little bit. You put your two-seater uh, uh, love seat, which is going to be your main thing. You put that, you know, facing straight on to the screen up at the front, and then you got your bar stools behind that and some cuddle seats, you know, forward and back when you need extra seating. Uh, that's how I would arrange the seats in here. I would go for sideways couches and then your love seat face on to the screen. 
that's fine too i think the long i think the long way is going to work as well as long as you get away from you know you basically you have one main couch that's just your mm-hmm. couch two flanking couches that are angled in right and then everybody else sits on the floor in the beanbag thingies yeah. that you're talking about yeah so room wider if you if you go for the wide setup room then that that way for the seating yeah good yeah and for the gary Digital Trends posts a review of the LG C9 OLED, and the reviewer made a side comment. Let's face it, today's TVs are not meant to last much more than seven years. Oh, God. Are there any figures to back that up? Does there need to be in this day and age? Can't we just say things that we believe and people believe it, and that's it? (laughs) Is he talking about TVs actually dying within seven years or just that people replace them that quickly because of the features? I don't know. Who knows what this guy is saying? But the reality is, is my TVs last longer than seven years. Yeah, no, I don't think it's a death rate. I don't think. No, I, I think he I think was it's referring an to upgrade yeah, rate. Yeah. You know, features change at this sort of rate. Uh, you know, we're going to be on to 8K. We already have 8K TVs. It's going I to just... become the thing whether we want it to or not. You know, after that, it'll be 16K. So here we go. It leaves such a bad taste in my mouth, comments like this, because it, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it well, I it's think just, more it than just that, reeks he... of 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 this sort of insider, like, oh, well, I I can't possibly have a TV longer than seven years. I mean, look at all the new stuff. I think a little out. more than that. It's the the reviewers saying because you know the reviewers on YouTube and that which digital trends post all their stuff on YouTube. You know, they get the comments like, you know, well, does this is this future proof? You know, and it's like, well, no. I think he's sort of saying, let's face it, nothing's future proof. You know, like it doesn't matter what I tell you. It doesn't matter how hey, good this TV to, is. Nothing was ever future proof. We just, you know, but it, we the, did the technology a... <laughs> last didn't 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 go along quite as. Yeah, no, you know, we had didn't... a point in time where people had CRTVs for a long time before yeah. this sudden burst of replacing your TV much more frequently. So yeah. I think it was more along those lines. Gary was just like, look, nothing, nothing about this TV, no matter how good it is, is going to be future proof. Yeah. yeah. So Chernov announced their Altitude 32 processor will be the first consumer processor to, d- to get DTSX Pro. Mm-hmm. They mentioned it will be a free software update for all Altitude owners in 2019. We'll Ish. see. That's up to DTS, <laughs> not Trinov. Yeah. It's said that how the home the, uh, the home version of DTSX has been limited to 11 speakers uh, until now. The commercial cinema versions can use up to 64 speakers. Trinov's implementation of DTSX Pro can use up to 32. Well, that would make sense. This is the name of the thing is Altitude 32, but whatever. <laughs> I bet they could do all 64 if they really wanted. They do have an Altitude 48. What uh, about if you have a 7.2.4 configuration? Will DTS-X Pro enhance that in any way? Nope. <clears throat> no? Well, why it would is it? entirely it, it, about adding more than 11 speakers. Yeah. Atmos can already do it, and DTS-X is just kind of catching up, and they have rebranded that catching up as DTS-X Pro to go beyond mm-hmm. 11. Any chance that we'll get... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll, Gary has a Marantz SR6011 that processes up to a maximum of 11 speakers. Any chance we'll get a DTS-X Pro firmware update? Or will DTS-X Pro only be found on brand new receivers in the future? No, I doubt it. I, it would be my guess. And I don't think it's there's, because... There's nothing for it to do. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but I mean, It's, it's let, only if you have more than 11 speakers that DTS-X Pro has anything to do. Right, that it can, you can't even plug that many speakers into this thing. That's right. Rob's yeah. saying. I mean, theoretically, you could repurpose some of the, you know, uh, outputs. The zone you know, outputs or something? Zones or something like that to be other speakers. But I think, Gary, you know, in this case, uh, you know, a receiver that's not meant to do more than 11 speakers already, even if you could somehow you know, finagle a way to make it, uh, you know, compatible with an external amp to do more channels. Processing power is going to be the limiting factor here. And what was inside this receiver was never meant to do this many channels and probably can't. Yeah, no, so, it's uh, like something like the Denon X8500H that can process 13 speakers, not 11. That might be something where you could add DTS-X right. Pro because then right. you could have a DTS setup that uses 13 instead of 11 speakers. Like right now, you can have 13 speakers hooked up to that X8500H. It can power all of them with its 13 built-in amps, and you can do that with 
uh, Atmos because you can have a 9.1.4 or a 7.1.6 configuration in Atmos. Right. But with DTS-X, it's limited. It tops out at using 11 speakers, even though it can process and power 13. So that is where you could definitely see DTS-X Pro. Will it get that update? I hope so. Uh, I don't know, but I hope so. I would so. think so. I, I would, yeah. I I would think, guess would think so. If it's, yeah. if it's like technically possible that they would. Yeah. As long as it's got the processing power, if the DTS yeah. doesn't have some sort of weird requirement. And like Mono Price is upcoming system. HTP1 that can do, uh, you know, 15 <coughs> speakers. It can do, uh, you know, 9.1.6. Hopefully that'll get DTS X Pro. If cost were no object, do we have any particular speakers in mind that would be an ultimate setup? We've had this question before. <laughs> and what configuration of speakers would we go to if we had an unlimited budget? I, you know, I, there is, I, if I had an unlimited budget, I would probably spend at least a couple of years listening to speakers mm. from all over the world. Yep. You know, I would, I, you could actually there, bring I, them to you. You have an unlimited I, budget. I mean, I, I would, I would not put them in this room. Well, no, you, know, say, I, yeah, I, yeah, you can, you can I, do what I, you please. I mean, I would build a specific, you know, a perfect home theater, perfect dimensions, tons of seats, great everything. And yeah, I mean, I, I I don't, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I don't know, I don't <laughs> know fine. that I, I've had enough. You're never going to have this enough. situation in real yeah. life anyway, so. I don't know that I've had enough experience with enough speakers for me to, to say for sure, for sure. Mm. I mean, in a two channel setup with if where I could sit with my head and device, I would get electrostatic speakers, mm. you know, some some fantastic imaging like like otherworldly stuff. But do I want that for home theater? No. Theater. I go with the JBL synthesis that are based on the M2s. Those would be my yeah. cost no object speakers. Uh, configuration. I mean, I'd go beyond eleven speakers. I definitely would. I, I think I might just go for a a nine point one point six as far as actual channel count goes. Uh, I mean, heck, we had that guy over in AVS Forum who actually did the experiment and went well beyond that. And he's like, yeah, 9.1.6 is all you need. And uh, I, I tend to think that that's probably the case. I, 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 this is 100% room dependent. It you is. Know, you need 9.1.6 if your room is a normal. Well, he's a unlimited large budget. I'm having a much room. larger room than my current. And then, which apartment. case? In which case, you're going to go bigger than yes, 9.1.6. Yeah. You're going to have. You know, well, I mean, I guess unlimited. Why? I'll I'll get the altitude 48 and I'll do 24.1.10. Why the heck not? It's yeah. possible. <laughs> when a review for a given speaker includes the phrase "good for the money," what do we inter interpret that to mean? Good for the money seems to imply but, right? So good for money, but what no he doesn't reply but uh to me when i said in reviews that it was good for the money i meant quite literally it was good for the money <laughs> i mean just <laughs> for the amount of money that i paid that I, that it, it its price tag was and i understand gary when i did reviews i almost never looked at the price before i started writing the mm -hmm. review like i was already through the review and then i would have to look up the price to see what it was i would have no idea what the price was and my reaction determined what i wrote right there i see yeah. my if my reaction was holy crap they, these only cost or uh <laughs> i mean i would think i i would think that for that phrase to exist you yeah. would have to say there do exist things that i have experienced that are better than these but all of those cost a lot more than this exactly. so these are good for the money Right. Yeah. I, I like you can't say that the phrase these are good for the money implies that uh, there is nothing better. It implies that there is something better, but that it costs a lot more than this. Don't you think that you, you, you could quite literally say every time we've ever recommended SVS subwoofers, they are good for the money. Yeah. They yeah. are quite literally good. They for are. The money. They, they are, are the best good, full for stop. The... And then they are the... also very good for the money. Yes. <laughs> so. I mean, I, I don't think I think I don't know what you want me to read into that, but I think it's 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 pretty. I much guess on he the just wants to know if they're saying there there is something better. There is always something better, Gary. <laughs> there is always something better. Okie dokie. All right, uh, Anaheim Josh. Uh, we thought we had talked Josh off the left. Oh Jesus! Nope. And convinced him that, that an SVS SB three thousand subwoofer is the right choice, even though his total cubic footage is roughly four thousand cubic feet, with his theater area being only a portion of in one small corner of the room. But now he's got in his head that a servo subwoofer, like what Rethevik offers, is the only way to go. Because why? Because his friends. I swear this is something his friends who were like tower speakers are the only thing, and he's like he rejected that, but somehow he has been convinced that a servo sub is the only what? way to go. What does a servo sub have that SVS does not have? The ability to be overdriven in extreme situations. And break? 
theoretically. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, yay, I can break my subwoofer. <laughs> Wee. <laughs> I mean, it takes an extreme situation to do it, but it's possible, whereas it's it's nigh impossible with the DSP yeah. protection of the SVSs. But uh, there you go. I don't know. He's been convinced. Servo sub. He built We're hinting at you, Josh, here. We're hinting at you. <laughs> That's not a hint. That's a hint like a wiffle ball bat That's to the right. face is yes. a hint. Yeah. He built cardboard models on our advice and was surprised and delighted when his his wife said that either the 15-inch ported or 18-inch sealed model from Rhythmic would be okay. Furthermore, as long as the price does not ex exceed $1,500 total, he could get two. So what should he get now? We already told you what to get. Yes. Stop it. I'm not talking to you anymore. <laughs> I mean, we... Look, look, I like Rhythmic subs a whole lot. I do too. If you I, need... We, a sub with the output capabilities of a PB4000, but for right. less money. Yes. I really like that FV15HP, which is probably the one he's looking at because it's $1,400 yeah. shipped. You don't need that much output. You do not need that box size because the FV15HP is even bigger than a PB4000. You do not need either of those things. You don't have to spend 1400 because you can spend 1000 on an SB3000 for something that fits really nicely in your room and has the appropriate amount of output. And the DSP protection is, I'm going to flat out say it, better than the servo protection because it just stops it from ever bottoming out. Yeah. Yeah. Also, your wife was like, if you get this, it has to be amazing. And you know what? An SB3000 is going to be amazing while being smaller and more affordable and appropriate. And dude, he, you're in a corner of a room. Yeah. So where are you putting the second sub that you're going to suddenly be able to get for 1500 bucks? You know, I mean, we did say start you... start with the one, and if you know, I mean, he he's repeatedly said he really only cares about the one seat. We're like, yeah, one seat, one sub. You will yeah. almost certainly be fine if you really notice problems that you cannot fix any other way. You can add the second sub later, but none of the advice has changed us. Your friends are getting in your head, and we're going to disagree with them and hopefully set you straight. Yeah, dude, drink beers with us, not with them. <laughs> His, do you drink beer, Rob? No. Nope. Yep. Drink beer with me, not with Rob or these other guys. <laughs> if You know what? If it takes drinking a beer, I'll drink a beer with Anaheim no, Josh. No one, no one wants to see you choke down the beer. You don't drink any alcohol? You don't have any I, any I really don't. Vices? I'm not. I'm like, I, I I could drink alcohol. I'm not like a, a, a posing oh, it no, no, uh, no, ethically no, no, or no, something like that. It's not yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, it's I, all right. I, I, got, I got friends like that. That's no big deal. I just, I guess you, Rob and I have never actually met each other. That is true. Not in person. That's right. If I come to your house, I expect there to be beer. Oh. His nearest neighbor's house is 60 feet away, but even so, he wants to make sure that when the bass is blasting, he won't bother him. What sort of room treatments like kick bass traps and acoustic panels help on that front? Not a one. Those don't help that at all, because you're talking no. about soundproofing and or sound isolation. And This is uh, a basement, right? This is still a basement. No, this is like a, uh, it's almost, as far as I know, it's almost like a converted outside room to an inside room type of situation. Oh, so it's like a Florida room situation where they, they've, they've roped it off? Okay. Um, yeah, dude, nothing. No, uh, nothing of that type. <laughs> nothing uh, of that type. No. That's I mean, gonna help with the, that. the thing you definitely want to do is decouple your subwoofer from the fo floor. So you're going to yes. want, I mean, SVS sells their isolation feet. If you want to pay 50 bucks, you could also just fold up a blanket and put it under your sub. But something has to damp the connection between right. the base of your sub and the floor. That'll help some, not a huge amount, but it'll really help some. I don't know that it's going to help. I mean, the... the... Oh, it, it, it stops the the actual physical structure of your building from say, shaking so much. Right, and that's and that could create sound waves that... Oh, yeah. Go like, through go your... through the ground into your right. neighbor. So that helps. Uh, well, that's but... about... That's about all you can do on that. Point. I mean, the only thing you can do other than it. like physically beefing up your like the whole the whole room, <laughs> all the walls. I'll, I'll and give everything. you an idea. Don't buy two rhythmic subs. <laughs> Let's just start with that. Buy one SVS. The, the thing you could do at a reasonable cost is making sure that you seal up every gap possible. We know he has porch doors, one of which never opens. Uh, we right. know he has windows in that. You caulk around everything that you can. You seal up everywhere that air could possibly right. move out of there, which is not a bad idea anyway from an energy saving cost point. That's perfectly a fine thing to do. So you make sure air can't escape out of this room and then you decouple the sub and that's about as good as you can do without getting into major construction so i my home theater is on is it it's not an outside room it's a room that was added on to 
the side of the house. So like the garage, like the, there's a bathroom and then behind the bathroom is my garage. Mm-hmm. So I'm at the back of the house in the back kind of back corner here. And my neighbor's house is maybe 10 feet away from my house. Mm-hmm. Maybe. And uh, during the winter in particular, I will watch movies and stuff in here with the windows open because it gets hot. Uh, because the heater's on. <laughs> <laughs> And with the, it's real. I mean, yeah. There's certain times of the year where I will listen with the windows on. I have asked my next door neighbor repeatedly if I if he's ever heard anything come out of my house that has bothered him, and he said no. And that's with with me occasionally watching with the windows open. No. So yeah, this 60 is not feet away. That's that's a decent that's amount a, of distance. That's a. I would not be too worried, but yeah. I mean, I would go into my. I would say, you know, when your neighbors around or whatever. I would go into my and say, "Hey, man, hold a second. I will be right back." You go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Crank everything up to like full reference volume. You know, Jurassic Park, some yeah. crap like that. Then walk outside and walk towards. You know, walk with them and say, "You hear any of this? You hearing this? You hearing this?" Until, yeah. you know, just make sure. But you know, Tom's I, I subs are decoupled. Decouple your yeah, subs. Nick. Nick is strongly considering some uh, Send Sierra Ryle towers and the matching Sierra Horizon Center, but whenever. Ascend is under consideration. Philharmonic Audio always pops up as an alternative since they also use Rao Ribbon tweeters, but some of their models cost less than the cents. In the case of the towers, the Philharmonic 3 costs... I, I just want to say, on a grammatical level, I don't like Philharmonic. <laughs> it, it, I, I find it... It's the same thing with the Schlitz, but it's not Schlitz. It's the the amplifier people that make me try to curse the S C H I I T them them yes i don't like them but philharmonic makes me angry on a punny level Mm. uh it's but the uh, okay probably but the philharmonic 3 uses a planar mid-range driver which nix finds enticing there's no perfect matching uh philharmonic center speaker for those towers though so would it make sense to mix and match the philharmonic towers with the ascend horizon center no (laughs) <laughs> just like yeah, that. I, I, I don't I, think so. I, 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 I think so. you're enticed by the idea of planar, but I am no fan of that open back planar mid range driver. Yeah. That's insane. Uh, that's not a good design, in my opinion. And you know, I've you never know why liked it's there. 360, 360 designs where they're like the open back, and yep. it's like, oh, it makes everything more and open. And when only oh, one really driver out of three is open back. But you know why that's there? It's because they give you tuning material, Mm. which is insulation, uh, stuffing, but they give you tuning material so you tune the mid-range driver to your preference, which is another way of saying, well, if you don't like this- We couldn't make it work. It's not our fault. (laughs) You try to make it work. It's up to you. You you do this. I I don't like that design at all. It costs more. It's way bigger. It's uglier. They don't have a matching center. And you also can't get them- um, because, I mean, Dennis Murphy is away, and, I mean, I don't want to disperse Dennis Murphy at all because I highly respect that guy, and he is taking care of some health issues in that, which is, you know, Godspeed to you. I hope things go well, but he's not taking any orders right now. No idea when he'll be back right. to do so. Um, just get the get the ascends, man. <laughs> well, I mean, and we're going to sound biased on this front, so and I can understand No, but I mean, like, legit, there's, so, there's but... all these reasons, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Get these ends. Ted on Twitter. Is jitter something to be concerned about? Nope. Let's go. <laughs> Next question. So Ted's got a pair of Oppo PM3 headphones right here mm-hmm. that he powers with a Dragonfly Rad. He's wondering if he can further improve the sound quality without getting entirely new headphones. How much better do you want it to be? It seems unlikely to him that more raw power in the form of a different headphone amp would greatly improve his sound quality. I would agree yeah, with I mean, that. The PM3s are not difficult to drive, and the Dragonfly Red can pump out plenty of power. So, yeah, nothing he to be done there. He was intrigued by some reviews of the Audio Quest Jitterbug. <laughs> God. <laughs> you see, the first problem was you didn't have a problem, and then Audio Quest told you you and had you know a problem. Who reviewed and they the sold you the Jitterbug? So, tell me it was Steve Gutenberg or whatever. Oh, I don't know. Maybe he did, but no, it, what hi fi and stereophile. Oh, geez. Two places you should never listen to <laughs> about anything related to audio. I mean, some of the stuff they say is right. It's just so much of the stuff they say isn't, and it's tough to tell them apart if you don't already know. No, you uh, can always tell when they're right. We can always tell when they're right. They'll say, 
you know, some people will claim that properly placing your subs will make a huge difference in your room. But I've always found. <laughs> so that first part, that was the right part. Mm. And then what I did was all everything after that was wrong. Mm. That's what I've always found in their articles. And I, I mean, they weren't always this way, I don't think. But Oh, I, they're catering I, to a crowd. That's what they're doing now. Oh, well, they are at this yeah. point. And, and, and they are their own crowd, too. So yeah. I don't think they're disingenuous about it. But, you know, they've grown up. And, and them quite most of them are quite old and i don't mean that in a disparaging way it's just the truth and they've been in this industry for a long time and they believe what they believe and there is no amount of science that's going to convince them otherwise <laughs> the earth is flat it's like ed on ed, ed on av so. forums as well he just he keeps spouting the same audio file lines and nothing can convince him otherwise Ed on AV forums. Yeah. Oh, I don't know this. Anyways. All right. So uh, he was intrigued by some reviews of the AudioQuest Jitterbug, which claims it can make a big sonic improvements by reducing noise, jitter, and packet errors from a USB output. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yeah. That's AudioQuest for you. You should read that copy. Wow. <laughs> wow. So what is jitter anyways? <laughs> and could anything other than a headphone upgrade improve uh, his sound quality by a noticeable amount? I don't even know if a headphone upgrade is going to improve it by a noticeable amount. We're talking about PM3s here. Yeah, these are planar magnetic headphones. You're going to have to really spend some money to get... Because these were not that expensive to begin with. Two, three hundred bucks or something like that. They weren't that bad. And you're going to have to spend some serious dough <laughs> to get a significantly... Now, you could get a different experience. Oh, different, significantly for sure better experience right i think would be hard because i've got experience these. that you prefer that's that's possible i've got the pm3s and the pm2s the pm2s mm -hmm. the over the year ones you know they're open backs and everything like that and i don't know i mean i know it's a difference you right. know, the difference between the open versus the, the closed back design but as far as sound quality i mean i don't know it's not that big of a difference so but the what uh, is jitter anyway jitter. We, yeah we can yeah. answer that so i mean in a digital signal it's being sent at a constant sampling right. rate, right? CDs, right, right. it's 44.1 kilohertz. So every 44,100th of a second, there is a sample that exists in this signal. And the device reading that signal also has to know to look at that signal 44,100 times per second. And those two things need to be aligned, right? The signal being sent and the signal being read need to be, you know, the sample needs to be there when the reading device is looking for it, and those two right. things need to be aligned. And if the clocks aren't perfectly synchronized and running really, really accurately, they right. can get a little bit out of sync. Yes. Now, it's plain as day when that happens. If you've ever had your digital audio signal goes, <laughs> you know, or you get click, 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 pop, click, 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 pop, yeah. That can be jitter. That's the signal getting out of synchronization. It's not a subtle thing. It's not, oh, a little veil was added to the sound. That's the, the, the yeah. wonderful <laughs> thing about digital connections. Digital connections aren't like analog connections. Analog yeah. connections, they can get like a little, it's like, it's like the you know, battery's running out of your your playback <laughs> device and it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what happens with digital. Nope. When, that, when it doesn't work, it's like clearly not working yeah. <laughs> you know? it's yeah. like hdm your hdmi signal you know hdmi cable does it is it doesn't have enough bandwidth for the 4k yeah. you get the 60, sparklies or you get a black screen black screen <laughs> it's like <laughs> or huge hmm. macro blocks coming i wonder out. if i need something to fix this yeah. signal yeah you yeah. do yes you do and, no this uh, is not but this, these, is, this is such a non-issue these it's been days a non we send forever. we send asynchronous signals anyway uh right. because we have large buffers in our devices that don't need to read the signal in like this all all the jitter stuff was early digital audio we didn't have buffers we had things that could barely transmit the signal at the rate it was going like everything was right at the threshold where it had to work perfectly or it failed and jitter was one of those things but now we have we oversample everything to these huge rates so that even if you did drop a bunch of bits you've got you know essentially bonus bits to make up the rest of the signal like i got bits on bits baby it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's just not an issue it, it really isn't <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, but uh, if you if any, you really want to get do, yeah, if you really want to increase your hand, your sound quality, uh, you've already got the, a headphone app, you know that you're using and that sort of thing. So I would experiment with uh, ordering some different headphones. I would look at other uh, you know high end models from Sennheiser. I would look at Audis, the High Fine yeah. Man yep. stuff. For sure, uh, I I know that every once in a while I take a gander over there and 
little drool comes out the side of my mouth as I'm <laughs> as I'm looking at their models, thinking, yeah, but if I if this five hundred dollar one is this good, I wonder how good that seven hundred dollar one is. <laughs> and if that seven hundred dollar one is that twelve hundred dollar one must be real good. up to their thirty seven hundred dollar flagships for a pair <laughs> no, of headphones. It, yeah, it does not stop. So, but he yeah. said, what could you do without getting different headphones? And one thing you could try, uh, you could definitely try for free the trial of the out of your head software on your PC. Sure. Sure. Because that uses the headphones you have to give you a very different experience. It's applying a head-related transfer function to anything that you're listening to. To Sometimes, if, if your head works with the head-related transfer function that they use by default in the out-of-your-head demo, then you'll get a really convincing sense that you're not listening to headphones anymore. You're listening to some actual speakers in a real room. Um, now, to customize it to your own head-related transfer function... That's a little bit more involved. You'd have to go to the paid version to do that. It's about 150 right. bucks for the full paid version. If you want a hardware device that you could plug all of your sources into, because the out-of-your-head software only works on a PC, so that would have to be your source. But there's a hardware device, which is actually where the out-of-your-head software was derived from. That is the Smith Realizer. Smith Realizer is a standalone processor. You plug your devices into it. It has Atmos, DTSX, and Oro 3D decoders built into it, as well as, you know, TrueHD and DTS Master Audio and all the rest of the decoders. So it's a full receiver, if you want to think of it that way, except it's yeah. meant to drive headphones. It does so by measuring test tones inside of your ears with microphones that they supply to give you a unique head related transfer function for your ears. It then measures your headphones again with the microphone still in your ears so that it's perfectly matched to the response of the headphones and they give you a head tracker which you can optionally use so that if you move your head around it's really like you know standing speakers in your room that don't change their position as you move your head all of that's in the smith realizer it's four thousand dollars so probably more than buying some new headphones but that would be a new experience without changing your headphones and one that you could take from headphone to headphone that yes. you upgraded your headphones too so very much that Unless it's like my leap motion sensor thing, in which case I plugged it into my computers today and it doesn't work anymore ever with any of them. My my uh, Windows 10 computer thinks it's a camera. Yeah, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> it's a drivers. All right, uh, I kind of want to stop because I'm falling asleep. That makes sense. What we have, what three left on the list? That's not so bad. Not so bad. So All those right, folks are Mark R and Rob W and Adam G. We'll answer you next week. All right, so I just want to tell you guys, uh, last week I accidentally transposed the six and the four and the number right. of the podcast on the on the post on our website, not on the file itself anywhere or anywhere else, just on the post. And one dude texted me. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how oh, I, I got saw my a Facebook of post. Of Maybe that. it was a Facebook post. Yeah, but I thought it was a text. I got one guy who says, like, "You Maybe probably Facebook a bunch of people alerted you by text." Maybe that's what they. Yeah, I know a, probably, a bunch of people probably have told you this, but it's showing as four sixty one instead of six forty one in iTunes. I'm like, you are literally the only guy who told me mm. that. So, so if you're ever sitting there thinking, "Oh, we don't have to tell Tom and Rob about this," <laughs> or "Oh, we don't need to donate to that podcast," they got lots of people to donate. You could be the only one. Like Adam, who went to www.avrant.com and clicked on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link to become our PayPal donator listener of the week. So thank you, Adam. Yes, Adam, thank you very much for that donation. And thank you to our AD patrons over at patreon.com. Yeah, that's patreon.com slash podcast if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. Thanks to our AD patrons. And before Tom wraps up the podcast, he probably wasn't sure if I wanted to mention this publicly or anything like that, but part of the reason why I am back a bit earlier than expected is because I did have an uncle who passed away, and so that has been part of dealing with that. So we did have this time away, and but now we're back trying to make sure that his wife of... Uh, Gosh, what, 72, 73 years they were together? <laughs> Jeez. That, that is a marriage that lasted right there. Um, yeah. So I, he, was, he was in his 90s, so this, this is not a, a, a shock that, that a person of this age passed away. However, he went, uh, he went very quickly. It was quite sudden, uh, which in some ways we're thankful for because there was no prolonged suffering or anything like that. He was, he was vital 
and completely with it. He didn't have any sort of, you know, degradation of his mind or spirit going on. So for him to have passed away quite quickly, that is that is a blessing in many ways. Um, but it was. We should all be so lucky to be honest. Exactly. It, it was a, uh, a difficult situation uh, for my aunt. Uh, they, they were just moving to a new place. <laughs> just as this happened and so that is a whole lot of change and a whole lot of stress to be going through so of course uh you know uh, our 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 little getaway that we were having not that there weren't lots of other people around to help and all that Uh, we weren't abandoning anyone and actually uh didn't want to be inundating her with everyone coming at her all at once and calling her and all that in fact requested that we didn't so Everything is going all right. Uh, funeral arrangements have all been made and all that. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's been going on. So if I was a little down on this podcast, that's that was in the back of my mind. Literally don't, no one could, pe- don't could possibly Don't think it came across. Told. And it's not like I'm <laughs> feeling super bummed out. But uh, you know what? This, this is a man who uh, he was there on D-Day. Uh, and if you're working out the math and you're going... Wasn't he a little young? Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, I'm not, not going to say how that happened, but uh, that is the sort of man that he was. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, uh, miss him, miss him sorely, Uncle Vic. Uh, Godspeed to you. I know you're, I know you're watching over us and 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 wishing us all the best and having a good laugh at at the all of us getting together and uh, and making the arrangements that we are. So uh, there you go. Just wanted to <laughs> let people know stuff happens in my life too. <laughs> that's right and you know all the best to you and your family you know this is this like you said even though it was not unexpected it's still well who's said, ever never... ready for anybody to go you know that's uh, <laughs> nobody ever is so. no they're not they're not so you know all the best to you and yours and Thank you know you. our thoughts are you know prayers to whichever deity that we all serve <laughs> <laughs> some of us i think pray to the 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 flat earth <laughs> all, 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 i guess so these days i guess they might so. they might i don't know so all right with that for av rant i'm tom mandry and i'm rob h now go out and listen to something once your question answered send it to question at avrant.com is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.